For you are good and your mercies endure forever. You're good. Oh God, you are so good. For your good and your mercies endure forever. Oh God, you are so good. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, living God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, thank you. Thank you, living God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Lord Jesus. Jesus. You are so good. For you are good, and your mercies endure forever. You are good. Oh God, you are so good. For you are good, and your mercies endure. You are so good, for you are good, and your mercies endure forever. You're so good, oh God, you are so
I thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, living God. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. Yeah. And I thank you, living God. Oh, we thank you, Lord Jesus. And we thank you.
Thank you, Lord Jesus. Pero ese te no. Cambio lo son de los mono en ella, si pena de dinero de los cutana en ella. Se pero na ma 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 mende de por na masa de eso. Just sing it one more time and I thank you Lord Jesus. And I thank you Lord Jesus. And I thank you living God. And I thank you, Lord Jesus. And I thank you, living God. You are so good, and your mercies endure forever. You are so good. Oh God, you are so good. Oh, you're so good, and your mercies endure forever. You're so good. Oh God, you are so good. You're so good, and your mercies endure forever. You're so good, and your mercies endure forever. You're so good. Oh God, you are so good. Pan na kutayan na masayan na 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 pipiya na do bato. Habra de vestikina na 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 sa daya sa. De este kine de limina na mana da kaya shpeya. Ambamre de beka ti ist beraneya. Volcan, a shiban de bedeno borum on an English day. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The camera be better, the kunga na man de zegiri tishti. Embre be better. Be better be better. Be arab na man. Sondo seli mai Zalande sito salavande lei Ida solamo sinde li lando De sila sondo vasilei vasai so the rumbelly die, yes, Ellie Bones, he die. Yeah, yes. Could have a silly dance on tea, Nelly Vay, Salatai, Volodon, Zivy Valley, Dalamo. Yes, Lord Jesus, we were living down, Zondelly Vos or Revive. Yes, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Father, for your grace. Thank you, Father, for your grace. Thank you, Father, for your grace. So, so you love with all my soul, a living Lord with all my strength, a living Lord from the depth of my heart. I love you, Lord, with all my soul, I love you, Lord, with all my strength. I love you, Lord, from the depths of my heart. I 
Oh, yes, Father. Yes. I love you, Lord, with all my soul. I love you, Lord, with all my strength. I love you, Lord, from the depths of my heart. I love you, Lord, with all my soul. I love you, Lord, with all my strength. I love you, Lord. From the depths of my heart, I love you, Lord, with all my soul. I love you, Lord, with all my strength. I love you, Lord, from the depths of my heart. I love you, Lord, with all my soul. I love you, Lord, with all my strength. I love you, Lord, from the depths of my heart. I love you, Lord, with all my soul. I love you, Lord, with all my strength. I love you, Lord, from the depths of my heart. And I live to see your face. To behold the glory, Lord, that's been throughout the ages. And I live to see your face, to behold your glory, Lord, the glory that has been throughout the ages. And I live to see your face, to behold your glory, Lord, to see the glory that throughout the ages found in you. Hallelujah. Ha ha. Hallelujah. Ha 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 ha. Ha hallelujah. Ha 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 ha. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And I live to see your face, to behold your glory, the glory that has been throughout the ages. And I live to see your face, to behold your glory, the glory that has been throughout the ages. And I live to see your face, to behold your glory, the glory that has been throughout the ages. I love you, Lord, with all my strength. I love you, Lord, from the depths of my heart. I love you, Lord, with all my soul. I love you, Lord, with all my strength. I love you, Lord, from the depths of my heart. And I live to see your face. To behold your glory, the glory that has been throughout the ages, Lord. And I live to see your face, to behold your glory, the glory that has been throughout the ages. I love you, Lord, with all my soul. I love you, Lord, with all my strength. I love you, Lord, from the depths of my heart. I love you, Lord, with all my soul. I love you, Lord, with all my strength. I love you, Lord, from the depths of my heart. And we live to see your face. To behold your glory, the glory that has been throughout the 
ages. And we live to see your face, to behold your glory, the glory that has been throughout the ages. I love you, Lord, with all my soul. I love you, Lord, with all my strength. I love you, Lord, from the depths of my heart. I love you, Lord, with all my soul. I love you, Lord, with all my strength. I love you, Lord, from the depths of my heart. You know, first of all, I'm, I just, I love songs that are born out of, just, that are just interpretation of tongues. Because, you know, as Ruth Ann and Elizabeth was hearing, I love you, Lord, with all of my heart. I love you, Lord, with all my soul. I was hearing at the same time integrated into all of that. It was almost like the chorus and the verse was being sung at the same time. These things, these things happen in heaven, and they're beautiful. Can you imagine a chorus being sung in such a perfect overlapping harmony that it, it meshes with the verse so that both the verse and the chorus are going simultaneously and nothing is lost? You talk about multitasking. But I, I was hearing... We live to see your face, to behold your glory, the glory that has existed from the beginning. And then the Lord just, you know, he hit me with this verse of scripture here that is on the heels of one of the most tremendous, what we would call passages or pericopes in the messages or sermons of Jesus. And of course, you've heard me refer to this over and again in John chapter 17, verses 21 through 23, because I'm struck by it. I'm all struck by it. I mean, some people get struck by a sunset or some beautiful thing. I'm just all struck. I've been all struck by this particular passage of Scripture for about, I don't know, at least for 20 years. At least for 20 years. I've been all struck just going, what on earth? What does this mean? And I've heard people talk about it all my life. But this verse of Scripture right here, verse 24, For Father, I will that... They also whom you have given me, I desire that they would be with me. Here's Jesus talking to the Father. This is him. And now I want you to keep in mind that he's not just talking to those who were with them, but he was also talking to those who would believe on him through their preaching. Okay? He says, Father, I want everyone that you have given me to be with me. Come on, man. This is Jesus' request to the Father. He's going to get his prayers answered. One time I heard a person say to another person, I'm sure your prayers are going to be answered. Well, I can tell you right now, I'm certain concerning Jesus. And here's what he says. That they may behold my glory, which you gave me. From the very beginning, because you love me. The love that you gave me. The glory that you gave me from the be very beginning. Because you, because you love me. Before the foundations of the world. That is amazing. 
there's this intimate, amazing, incredible love going on between the Father and the eternal Word. And God so loved me that He sent His only begotten Son. This day have I begotten thee, said the Lord, when Jesus was born of the Holy Ghost in the womb of a virgin named Mary. Father loving me so much when I was dead in my trespasses and sins. Offered up his son, his son for us. Spared not, Paul said. Spared not. That's to say to spare no expense for him. To think that God looked out over time and eternity and saw you. And said, I'll spare no expense for you. Spare no expense for Leslie, for Cade, for Ann, for Michael. Spare no expense for Brittany. Spare no expense for you. You put your name there. The one for thou, Jesus saying, thou lovest, you've loved me. Before the foundation of the world. This is a love. I mean, listen, I'm telling you right now. When you get into a love thing, my wife and I, we got this love thing going on. I mean, we got this amazing love thing going on. And what happens is that you ultimately come into a place where you begin to discover love. I've, I've looked at people who've been married for 60, 70 years. And they got a love thing that is going on that nobody can even get, no one can even get into they can't even imagine it because you got to do it to see it to understand it you can't know it till you do it and so many people opt out of the process they allow satan to steal from them one of the most beautiful glorious things that god has given us the privilege of having i'm going to tell you something i believe that god after that satan had rebelled against god father determined in his wisdom to confine man to an earthly terrestrial body so that within the confines of the relationship that he set up between Adam and Eve, they could discover something that they wouldn't be able to discover otherwise. And you'll know more about that later. But the beauty of it all is, is there's this love relationship that's not been going on for 100 years, not going on for 900 years, but a love relationship that has been going on for the ages, for eternity. Between the Father and the eternal Word who became the only begotten Son whom we call Jesus. Which is to say, God's salvation. The Lord's salvation. The Christ or the Messiah. The Deliverer. The Redeemer. The Savior. Hallelujah. You know, when, when, the, when the Lord says that, when He's saying, you know, He's asking Him to do something on His behalf. You've loved me. Lord, you loved me. You've loved me. You're, I've been the object and the, of your love before anything ever was made. And I'm asking you, let these that you gave to me be with me so that they can behold my glory. Because there's something about this. this there, there, there's no pride in this. There's no, there's no earthly concept in it. He, it's something that when we get to observe and interact with, huh, just the very presence of it causes universes to be created. And not just galaxies, not just solar systems. I'm saying universes. Somebody say, how could that be? How could there be more than one? I'm telling you with God. You know, just, I'm telling you there's no end to creation. There's no telling what all it looks like. How multivariant it is. How beautiful it is. It's all perfect. Whatever it is, it's all perfect. We know a little snippet of it right now. And God is, in His mercy has come to introduce all that He is and all that He wants for us and all that He is doing and all that He has done. He's come to introduce these things to us. Through a relationship with himself by Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? He's come to show you all the dynamics of an unimaginable, unfathomable creation. And he will express it and show it to you. All the secrets to the universe, which science, though they gave themselves to an eternity to discover they could never fully understand. He's come to show and unveil it all to us through a simple relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you got to get all the pollution out of it. Amen. You can be seated. Um, 
I, we, first of all, we're so happy that you're here. I've got a heart full of things to talk to you tonight about so that you'll be different. I'm, I'm not talking to you tonight so that you can have information. If you come to get a motivational message, it's going to be powerfully motivational. Okay? It's going to motivate you by the power of the Holy Ghost right into uh, proper cooperation with the living God. This is what we believe. We just believe this. We know it. And um, we want to talk to you about stepping over into the realms of a more pure interaction with the living God. And I hope everybody's interested in this. A more pure, un unaffected uh, by the things around you, un uninhibited, okay, unhindered, hallelujah, access to more unlimited. Listen, you don't have to talk God into giving you anything. He's freely given us. If he spared not his own son, but offered him up for the sins of us all, shall he not also by him freely give us all things? Let me just tell you again, if there's any verse of scripture you want to get down, memorize. This is not a hard one to memorize. It's in my DNA. This verse of scripture, these words of God are in my spirit. They're in my being. That's why it's not hard to memorize. It gets in you. You give yourself to the word. He who spared not his own son, but offered him up for the sins of us all, offered him up for my sins, for your sins. How shall he also buy him? Shall he not also buy him freely give us all things? And the answer to that rhetorical question is absolutely, okay? And that's Romans 8.32. I mean, it's just so beautiful, the confidence that you find in love. When somebody really loves you, you're very secure. You know, if I get a little bit antsy, a little bit stressed, you know, I start getting a little mm, huffy. My wife, she just puts her arm, she just puts her hand on my back and just starts rubbing my back. Immediately, it's just boom, I'm just there. I'm, I'm fine, okay? It's just, it's perfect. You know, she don't say, it's all right, honey, it's going to be okay. Just puts her hand there and just kind of, you know, this, this is the arresting power of love, the security the influence of love, hallelujah. And, and if, you've never, if you've never been in one of my marriage counseling uh, uh, sessions, you need to get married so you can come to one of them. <laughs> because, I mean, I talk, to, I talk to you about principles, I talk about principles and dynamics of love. That someday the Lord's gonna release me to be able to write a book on it, the action and the reaction within the framework of where we're at when we're born as, as, as children in this world and then where we're at when we've been born again of God and then this maturing process to the place where we ultimately are functioning in all the love and the characteristics of the living God which is the growth process that we're going through it's not a salvation process it's a growth process you got to get saved to get into the growth process you know you, you don't get to receive anything from the Holy Ghost until you're redeemed until you made a new creation and you know one of the things I have in there is the pendulum over top of this great gradient of transition and the pendulum is action and reaction people learning how to react properly to every action because there's a lot of bad actions coming at you and if you're not careful you're just going to react with a bad action you're going to react with this you know in kind whatever's coming at you and what father wants us to do is he wants to always to react in his kind and Father is bringing us into a place of maturity. A lot of people don't want to grow. They don't want to grow emotionally. Most people want to stay somewhere between 3 and 12 years old emotionally. I'm telling you this. I'm, I'm not doing this in an insultive way. You can go and do some, some analysis on it yourself. Just, you know, start. I mean, I hate to tell you to do this, but if you really got to, you know, got to figure it out for yourself because you can't believe that you could possibly be somewhere between 3 and 12 years old, just start doing some basic human behavioral uh, uh, science research, you know, and find out. Emotionally, people don't really grow. When, when, when it comes to that, that, that development and, and that growth of, of how that you behave yourself, okay, it was some, at some point in time, we got to quit throwing temper tantrums and, and stop perceiving the world as a brat, okay? And uh, we, we're going to have to be willing to start doing more of those things which Christ Jesus did and does. He's constantly giving. It's all the arrows go out. God is unselfish. He's constantly just giving, 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 expecting nothing in return. He's an amazing person. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it, that is the, when that is the personification of maturity, emotional, psychological maturity, and spiritual maturity, then you got to wonder where you're at because you were born with all the arrows pointing in, completely selfish, gimme, 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 and give it now, otherwise I'm going to scream louder. 
and I'm going to get madder. And somewhere, then you to take that gradation, and then praise God, we were born again. We made a new creation. Hallelujah. <laughs> and God gave us a new heart and a new spirit. But I'm going to tell you right now, that's a newborn baby. And unfortunately, a lot of people have not desired the sincere milk of the word where they may grow thereby. And I don't know how many arrows are pointing in and how many are going out. I don't know how much love is really being allowed to dominate, which I'm talking about the love of God that lays down his life, who, who always bears a sin, who always is there making intercession. This kind of love that doesn't have a complaint, that doesn't have a, a finger of accusation. Boy, amazing love. God's amazing love. Amazing love. That, how he could love someone like me. And I know you can agree with that, but how about this? How he could love someone like you, that might be a little harder for you to agree with. Are right, you listening to me? And that's pointing to the issue. And it's touching on the issue, but, but barely, just barely. Uh, we could actually peel this thing like an onion and get down to some layers that would make you begin to cry. But we're not going to do that tonight. <laughs> Okay, we just want you to be gently led by the Spirit of the Lord. We want you to grow in grace. We, we want you to take a hold of this wonderful realm. We want you to understand you're going to have to start growing. And you're going to have to start. And that's a, that is something that doesn't happen passively. It's actively. It's not something that's going to happen just because you showed up to the meeting and because you want to. It's going to happen because you are participating, participating. You're desperate about it. You're giving yourself to these things. And then, you know, there's this growth. And, th and this growth is, you know, I've been talking to you about it like I'm fed up to hear with you, right? You look in the mirror and go, I'm fed up to hear with you. You're getting fed up with yourself to the point that you're saying, wait a minute, I got a glimpse of that glory. And, uh, and that glory has been given to me as a gift. And the self and the realms of self is keeping me from it. Being a little baby, throwing temper tantrums, constantly wanting things my way. Always worried that somebody don't love me. Always afraid that something bad's going to happen. And all the rest of the negative people, that negative things that negative people are stuck in. There's not a negative thing in God. You know, if God's people would grab a hold of Philippians chapter 4 verse 8, your whole life would be changed. Um, my wife and I, we are constantly challenging each other and encouraging each other to change. And when we do, we talk about how difficult it is. Well, we say, look, let's just size this up. I know it sounds simple, but it's so difficult it probably won't happen. So in that we know the nature of the challenge, okay, we recognize that we have to think different about things. Do you know how hard it is for you to think different about things? If you believe that you have to wash those dishes before you put them into the dishwasher, you're not going to change because it is a part of your psyche. It's part of the way that you think. You believe this. You, you can't be persuaded of anything else. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's a thousand and one things in your life that are just that, like this example that I'm giving you. But if you could somehow be persuaded, wait a minute, I don't have to wash those dishes before I put them in the dishwasher. They're going to come out just as clean if I don't. I know I've been trained since I was three years old to say I've got to wash them before I put them in there. Otherwise, they're not coming out clean. But technology is better today than it was when you were three years old. And if you've got to do anything else, just press the button for a second cycle, and then that will help you because that's what you've got to do. You've got to inch your way into change because it's too hard. It's a battle of the mind. It's too hard. I can't possibly put this dish out in front of somebody knowing it ain't clean. When in reality it is clean. But the perception, you see. The mind has to stop, has to start thinking differently for change. It has to stop thinking the same way it's been thinking for change. Otherwise, no change. You can say hallelujah, praise God. You can get down in the altar every night and go. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> and blow tissues, uh, uh, holes, giant holes in tissues, be, being sincere. But nothing will happen just because you're sincere. Nothing really will happen. Because God the Holy Ghost is going to stand there and he's going to still deal with your will. And your mind and your thinking is so wrapped up in your will. Your perception of things. What it is you believe. It is hard for God. It is hard for God to convince us of things different than what we believe. I'm sorry to tell you, but you're trapped in this big old monkey trap. And you're going to have to let go of that banana. 
you're going to have to let go of that thing. And it's really that simple. A monkey trap is ridiculous. It's ridiculous how a monkey trap works. The monkey's outside the cage the whole time. He's never caged. He reaches in. He grabs the fruit. He's not letting go of that. He's trapped. He will not let go of it. Even though men come around him with a net. And he should be scared out of his mind and let go of the banana. He's running with the banana. Or he's not going at all. Reality of it is he doesn't even process it that way. All he's got is I have a banana in my hand. And I'm going to get it to my mouth. That's all I can think about. The monkey trap of life. Oh, come on, people. I'm talking to you. I'm sorry to be talking to you like this tonight. <laughs> I just am desperate to help you understand how you've got to learn how to think different. You've got to be willing to sit around with people and process and say, look, guys, I know you love me, and I want you to help me to be able to start looking at things different, thinking about them different, dealing with them different. I know what the Bible says, but it seems so hard, so out of reach. It seems so impossible for me to have a practical application within the framework of my life so I can start walking on water. You hear me? It, okay, I want to take it to that level. So I can start walking on the water. So I can start raising the dead. So I can start moving and they get to faith. <laughs> you know, Satan knew it. The tempter came to tempt him. And if you want to understand temptation in the Bible, you've got to understand that Satan has for his title the tempter. God does not have for himself the title the tempter. You understand me? Okay. And the tempter came to tempt him. And he said, if you are the son of God, speak to the stones and they will be made bread. Huh? Satan knew the power of speaking the word of faith. He understood it. Anybody moving in that realm, come on. But you've got to think different and do that because you don't think stones can ever be bread. Huh? And the Lord goes into it, takes it down the level. Level says stones can have mouths. He said, if they, you know, they say the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the lawyers and the rulers of Israel saying, tell all these kids to be quiet. I mean, they're just hysterical. They've gotten completely beside themselves. And they crying out, Hosanna! <laughs> Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. <laughs> Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And um, so, that wasn't tongues, that was Hebrew. At any rate, uh, just, so every, just want to make sure everybody understands. Until you, uh, until you discern. There'll come a day you'll discern. I'm believing, we, we, God had me move on, on Sunday night, man, I felt the miracle power of God. You know how I, I know and discern the miracle power of God? Such brokenness, such great compassion overwhelms every part of your emotion. And I knew that the miracle was the handing out and the dispersion of gifts. And I know that God is working to bring some of you into a place to move in the office. There's an office. There's various different offices in the church. One of them is the interpretation of tongues. Hallelujah. God put that in the church. I don't care what your preacher or priest said. That don't matter. If, they, if your preacher or priest says exactly what the Bible says, good on them, as they say in Australia. Okay? But if they don't, they wrong, period. I don't care who they are. Doesn't matter to me. So he's judging. I am, absolutely. Because the word of God is already judged. The word of God is the judgment. And if I don't declare the judgment of God, then I am by default a, a deceiver. I'm not going to be a deceiver. I'm going to declare God's judgments. The judgments are right. He said if they don't speak according to this word, it's because there's no light in them, you see. And so... My goodness, dear people, we want to grab a hold of the Word of God and believe these things. And if God says the office of the interpretation of tongues is in the church, then it is. And it says so in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That's one of the things. Just like he put apostles in the church, he put in the church tongues and interpretation of tongues. That's an office, you see. Hallelujah. Function is in the church. But, you know, I'm just, I'm just believing God that you step over and, and just understand how easy it is to flow in the giftings of God. However, you've got to start thinking different. Because what's going to happen is you can get locked into fear. Fear will have an, a, 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 ter, a tremendous influence on the way that you process. You're never going to be comfortable enough. See, 
uh, perfect love cast out all fear. And when you just get over here and this, ooh, hallelujah, just, you know, just singing these songs, flowing in the Holy Ghost, just worshiping Jesus. I'm telling you, dear people, it's a wonderful place and state where you just, you know, you're just being loved, you know. And, and, and just understanding, I mean, if there's anything else you just want to understand, just, just get this. You know, if the Lord, if he loves you so much, he didn't spare his own son. He said, I'll spare no expense for you. I want you. And I want you in relationship with me. I want you in my kingdom. I want to be, I want to be able to bless you. You're my child. I want, I want to make you my child. Huh? Satan came and stole my property. Huh? And, and, and the kinsman redeemer came and, and redeemed us back unto, <laughs> hallelujah, our father and gave us to us, released us in the jubilee of God and restored us back unto the inheritance that we had in him. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Isn't God good? I mean, you need to get into these things and, and think along these things, along these lines. Otherwise, you're going to constantly be populating your life with the way that you perceive uh, earthly things, the way that you've learned how to, to manage yourself and, and, and the way you've learned how to be responsible, which is not responsibility at all. It's not respons Re True responsibility is seeking first the kingdom of God and his, re his righteousness. True responsibility is doing and keeping those things that God has commanded because I'm going to tell you right now, He's going to judge us on the basis of what our true responsibilities were. And we have a wrong way of thinking, a wrong way of perceiving things, and we have identified responsibilities that are self-serving and are actually a part of a system that is designed and created by the prince and the power of the air, the spirit of disobedience, the God of this world who works right now in the children of disobedience. You're listening to me. Do you understand? Father's got another realm. Hallelujah. And he's come and he's introduced us to this other realm through Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, who is the door and access into this realm, who when we called upon him, the Holy Spirit came upon us, overshadowed us, and brought forth in our lives a new creation, a new heart and a new spirit. And put his Holy Spirit in us so that we can now all be taught of God. Now it's time to get with the process and forget. You know, we're, we're talk about having to go through the school of unlearning. I'm in the school of unlearning. I'm unlearning all the things that I've been taught to value and all the things that are so important based upon the standard of our culture. And God the Holy Spirit is teaching me how to unlearn by patiently, with lots of love and long suffering, instructing me in the ways of life. Isn't that good? He's an amazing God. But how, how hard of a case are we going to be? I mean, how, how, you know, how challenging are we going to be for the Holy Spirit? I want to be a good student. Huh? I want to learn how to turn bread. Uh, I want to learn how to walk upon the water, turn water into wine. I want to learn how to move in the things that the Lord Jesus Christ describes to us. I don't want Jesus, as I minister on Sunday morning, to look over at me like he looked over at Philip, knowing in his heart what he was, Jesus knowing already what he was going to do, says to Philip, Philip, what should we do? And Philip immediately gets, forgets about the Jesus turned the water and wine, forgets the Jesus command the wind and the waves, puts his, gets his calculator out and says, we need 200 penny worth of bread, uh, 200 penny worth of bread or eight months worth of wages just to give everybody a little bite. And, you know, he gets the big gong, gong. Now, that's not what we're going to do. It's not how we do it. We take five barley loaves and two small fishes and we feed 5,000, not counting women and children, so easy, 15,000. And we're going to take up 12 baskets full over the, at the end just so we can show that God's always more than enough. He has, he's not stingy, huh? He's always, there's always plenty at the table. There's going to be leftovers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. What is he talking to us about? He's talking about his care for us. He's talking about his compassion for us. He's talking about his love for us. He's talking about a miracle power extended to us through him. A miracle power extended uh, to us so that we can function in the same miracle power with him. All of the above. But you've got to grow. You've you got to mature in the things of the Holy Ghost. And you've got to think different. And in the process of thinking different is all convoluted with so many different things. And number one is, is the processes of your imagination. The processes of the way that... Uh, you you meditate the way that you think the way that you perceive the way that you the way that you uh, feel about people the way that you interact with people all those all of those things convolute how you think how your how your mind works 
And, and God's going to show us on a basic, in a very simple way, how to, how to erase that, uh, that all those things that we've learned. How to unlearn them. He's going to show us through a very process, simple process how to think the way he thinks. And he's going to do it, he's going to do it on the basis of, okay, you ready? Ready? You ready to learn? Right now, you ready? You ready? Some, are you ready? I'm asking you a question. This is not rhetorical. Are you ready to learn? And everybody says yes, and praise God, and hallelujah, and shout, and, and he says, okay, I want you to walk in love. And everybody's standing there going, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a minute. I thought we were going to get translated and have a vision. And that, no, he said, I'm going to show you how this works. I'm going to show you how to completely redefine your life and everything around you. And it's going to be on the basis of the same love that I have for you when I go to the cross. And I said, that's too ridiculously simple. No, it's not. Try it. Give yourself a try. Give yourself a run at it tomorrow. <laughs> Hallelujah. And just find out how mature you are. See if you can walk in love for five minutes. <laughs> see how long you can walk in love. I mean, see, I mean, it's, I'm talking about five minutes in the midst of whatever your worst problem is. In the midst of your most controversial relationship, or the one that, the one that's troubling you, the one that aggravates you, the one you 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 go walk miles around to not have to confront, because he didn't walk miles around nobody. He stepped right down in the midst of our ugliness. Hallelujah! And when we were ungodly, without God in this world, when we were enemies and alienated by wicked works, when we were without strength. <laughs> All of those words, you know, the, I've just quoted various different fragments of verses of Scripture. How many of you know that? Okay, very good. I just don't want you to think I'm making this up as I go. This isn't my idea. Because I don't know anything. None of us know anything as we ought. Our wisdom is the Word of God. Praise God. Our wisdom is the Holy Spirit. Our, when, when we make God's Word our wisdom, when we make God that which the Holy Spirit speaks, which is the revelation of His Word, or He just speaks forth the Word, then we have the wisdom of God. The ages of the ancient of days. Hallelujah. Praise God. He, 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 and just think about this state, you know, <laughs> when we were without strength. I'm going to tell you right now, watch yourself because you'll look at people without strength and you'll despise them. It's that guy standing there on the side of the road holding out, you know, that looks as an able-bodied worker who could actually go do something. And he says, we'll work for food. Be careful. You know, and there's other situations that we could create that we begin to despise people. Uh-oh. Uh, we, love just went all the way to zero. No, it went to negative something. Okay? It's actually negative 70. Huh? Uh, they're pushing on negative 230. Isn't that, Kelvin? Absolutely nothing's moving now. That's totally dead. Huh? That's one of them scientific things, you know. It's another, it's another, uh, it's like, you know, instead of Fahrenheit, Celsius, Kelvin. Okay, we'll, we'll leave that alone. <laughs> You just got to have different scales for different uh, standards. The Lord has brought us into a different scale. He's brought us into a different standard. He's brought us out of the earthly into the heavenly. Did you know that? Oh, I'm just a human being. Well, get over it. Quit acting like that. Quit being that way. Quit being just a mere man, a mere human being. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you act as mere human beings. You're not supposed to be acting that way. You've been translated from the kingdom of this world into the kingdom of the dear son. You in heaven. Mike, can you imagine what would happen to you if you could get your perception, your, your mind, and the way you think to, uh, uh, to accommodate God, to now to start thinking in the processes that you are seated in the heavenly realm, that you are a citizen of heaven, that your conversation in heaven, that you live by the Holy Ghost, you live by God the Holy Ghost. God lives in you. My goodness, you would be, I'm telling you, that's the hardest thing to get anybody to believe. Well, it's the hardest thing to get anybody to think. Think, the mind thinking, the mind's activity, the perception of things. Because I still believe that I've got to wash the dishes before I put them in the dishwasher. And if I don't, they're not going to be clean. The perception. I can't possibly wrap my thinking, my processes of thinking around the idea I perceive myself to be so unworthy, so unlovely that I can't even begin to, I perceive myself to be so earthly, so human. I perceive myself to be this and that and the other thing. I cannot imagine that God, the Holy Ghost, has made me his tabernacle, his dwelling place. 
Dear people, this is an interaction of love that brings us revelation. God in his mercy gives to us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ Jesus so that we might understand the inheritance that he has in us. It doesn't say he gives us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Christ Jesus so that we can understand the inheritance that we have in him. That might be easier to wrap our heads around. Wow, he's given us a big inheritance. He's dead, he's got everything, and he's made it ours, all right? No, no, no. He turns it all the way around and begins to talk to us about something that we can't even begin to process. He talks about his inheritance in us, that he's given to us a guarantee that we're his. Wait, 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 wait. Should that be the other way around? He's given to us the earnest money that he purchased us. Well, wait, aren't we supposed to? No. He took all our works out equation all our efforts all that we could gain or attain he took he said there's there's something about us that he what is man that you are mindful of him of him and the son of man that you visit him people father's leaving in a secret right now it's cert, to certain degree of it the certain measure of it is revealed in jesus christ the man christ jesus of what God and who God purposed us to be when he formed Adam from the fine dust and took from his being the, the, the life and made from that life, from that being of his life, of his bone and of his flesh, a woman. That they may be one, joined together, now they're separate to discover themselves back in oneness through this relationship of love. Listen, there are things about who we are and what God has in us and what we mean to him that you just have to wait and see later. But right now you can engage in the love relationship and find out that he really, really loves you. He really, really, really loves you. I mean, he loves you more than anybody's ever loved you or ever will love you. He loves you. Beyond anything that you could possibly ever imagine or reciprocate. So he, pulls, he pours forth his love into us by the Holy Ghost. But we're just having a real problem receiving that. Because we're stuck with some emotional problem, some psychological problem, some relationship problem. We're throwing a fit on somebody. If not God. It's like our dear friend R.T. wrote a book, Forgiving God. And that's about where people are at. But we're in the process of forgiving God. That's really flipped around. That one you don't find in the scripture. But the publishers thought it would be catchy. And it turns out that the book isn't really about that. It's about people having to deal with lies in their life. Of where they blamed God for things that God never did. They put the blame on the wrong person. But people are always blaming. Blame. blame. You, could you imagine how wonderful I would be if everybody wasn't around me messing me up? <laughs> Stopping me, hindering me, keeping me back from fully blossoming to be all that I otherwise could be and do and accomplish. If I didn't have all these people talking bad about me and running interference and stealing stuff from me. And every time I'm about ready to, you know, step into my position, somebody else pushes me out of the way and steps in place of me. These things go on cuckoo. We're a little funny. And the Lord's come here to give us some sanity. Hallelujah. He's come to help us think properly. He's come to calm us down and say, look, you know, like nobody's out to get you here. And if, you're not, if they are, who can be against you when I'm on your side? You know, I mean, come on. Just got to quit get out of the blame game. He said, she said, they said. Get out of all that mess. I, I can't believe it. No, I, I'm crushed. What's wrong with you? Well, so and so said that so and so said that so and so <laughs> said that they didn't like me or that I said something that I never said. Well, how did you know that it got translated that many generations away from you? That's like a universe away from you. Did you go to so and so who heard from so and so? That so and the other so and so that said to retrace your steps. No, you don't do it. You just immediately count it, count it true. What happens all of a sudden if we go and start living by Philippians chapter four verse eight? What happens if we do that? What happens tonight if I could get you to change the way that you live, to change the way that you think, to change your perception, to conform to the word of God, to where that if it's good, that's you think about it. If it's not good, you don't think about it. 
Right? Let's just, let me just, I want to just show you this. Because this is a little, this is a little small uh, snippet of his glory that he wants us to behold. Huh? I mean, people, come on, people. You're going to have to quit being so fearful and so negative. Nobody likes me. Uh, you know, it, it's something bad happened to you when you were four or five years old on the, on the playground during kindergarten. And everybody came around you and pointed fingers and said, you're ugly. And you've never gotten over it. So now you believe all you hear for the rest of your life, you're ugly. So now you imagine it, that anybody who's got anything to say, they're saying something bad about you. I don't know what it is that's marred people's lives so. But, you, could, we, you know, look, come on, we're going to have to just get over it. We're going to have to believe different things. It's got to somehow not be important anymore. You're going to have to start loving people more than you love yourself. So, it, so they become more important to you than you are important to you. Everything begins to change. It all gets good. You want me to tell you how to live a most beautiful life? A most burden-free life? Would you like to know how to live so? It's, you'll be so unburdened of all your stuff. You won't be sad and depressed and sorrowful and get up every day on the wrong side of life. <laughs> Not just the wrong side of bed, okay? Can I help you? Here it is. Forgive everybody. Bless everybody. Love everybody. You won't have one unhappy moment for the rest of your life. You won't be tormented one moment. You won't be wondering, I wonder what they're thinking about me now. I can't believe it. They betrayed me. Ah. <laughs> Can you imagine? What a grievous life. That's death. Dear people, come on. Let's go ahead and grow up, please. The Lord wants us to grow up into him in all things, who is the head, even Christ Jesus. Just to think that you and I have the honor, the privilege, the opportunity to grow up into him in all things, to come into the fullness of the measure of the maturity of Christ Jesus, to, to be rooted and grounded and settled in love so that we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the height, the breadth, the length, the depth. People are going and pursuing wrong avenues to have this full-blown revelation of His glory when God makes it very simple to know the love of Christ. To know the love of Christ. You want to behold the height, the breadth, the length, the depth, that which is accessible to all saints. You want to behold and know and understand all the fullness of God. It's all found in knowing it by experience, by participating with this love of Jesus Christ. This love of God. Listen, people, some of you beat, beat yourself up terribly. I can see you come in battered and bruised from condemnation. Battered and bruised from not meeting your standards. When if you don't meet your standards and you do that yourself, what are you doing to everybody else around you? You got you to quit thinking that way. You got to quit thinking that your standards are wrong. Your measures are wrong. Your evaluation is wrong. You're psychologically whacked. I'm just going to say it that way because I want to make it bad. Can I make it bad? Can I make it ugly? So you go, I'm not doing that anymore. That's whacked. That is ugly. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to do the right thing. I want, I want to get on with the program. Listen, there is a lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on. I praise God for all the good and wonderful things that are going on in the church. But you know, there's so much more going on in the Bible that we haven't even begun to realize. I want to get on with the program to get into that. I, I, listen, I understand what is essential. I understand the maturation. I understand the preparation to be prepared unto every good work. I understand what Father is expecting for us to participate with Him in if we are going to be able to fully represent Him. And He's retaining the rights as to who's going to be able to fully represent Him or who's going to represent Him on any level. He retains the right. He, you, you can say all you want. You can claim it by faith all you want. But until you get right, you're not going to get right because He's not... Gee, listen, Father is devoted to the name of Jesus being glorified He's not going to let it be profane. He's not going to empower people to profane the name, okay? And you're going to learn how to walk in lowliness and meekness. Jesus said, you want to find rest? Hey, are you laboring and heavy laden? Are you burdened and messed up? Are you tired of being who you are? Listen, he said, come unto me. I'm going to teach you a whole new way of living. I'm going to give you a whole new standard. I'm going to give you whole new measures. I'm going to give you a whole new perception of things. I'm going to show you. 
and teach you that meekness and low, lowliness is far better than pride and arrogance. Now, let me just tell you something. In this world, in the system of the world, pride and arrogance get you ahead. In the system of the kingdom of God, the way up is down, okay? Pride and arrogance doesn't get you ahead. It gets you way behind. You don't even get to participate. Meekness and lowliness. Things that people say, have you meek and lowly and broken? I mean, you're just going to get run over top. God didn't make me a doormat. You know, that's really a negative way of looking at it. Let's go ahead and read uh, Philippians chapter 4 for just a minute. I, I, God wants to bring you to a place. God wants to bring you to a place. Okay, I want you to get this. Hang on. This is a tough one. The word that there could be 99 bad things happening and one good thing. And you just simply stick with the one good thing. And you don't even think about the 99 bad things. Reality of it is, people, is there more good things happening in our life, right now, in your life, than bad things, and you have absolutely no right whatsoever to even think one moment on a bad thing. You are supposed to say, that is wrong, that is sin, that is keeping me from being able to move forward, that is robbing my time, that is, that is making me weird, and I'm tired of all of those things. <laughs> and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cast down imaginations. I'm going to learn how to bring into captivity every thought. I'm going to learn how to let the Word of God rule me. Man does not live by bread alone. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Because that's what it comes down to. As far as most people know, men do live by bread alone. Father says, no, sir. Men do not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds out of the mouth. Mouth, 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 mouth. I hope it sounds like an alarm. Mouth, mouth of God. This word is spirit and life. It's not, you know, dry ink on dry paper or black ink on white paper. Listen to me. This is his words of his mouth. It's spirit and it's life. It's powerful. You want to live I want you to get into a realm of living where only the life of God exists within that living. We want you to have life that only has life in it. That's joy unspeakable and full of glory. The measure, let me help, can I help you with something? The measure of your lack of joy unspeakable and full of glory is the measure of your spiritual immaturity, which is a measure of your selfishness, living your own life, doing it your own way, not willing to grow spiritually. Only God's people can gain heights of emotional and psychological maturity because man within the world of men is going to, they are, they're going to reach a threshold quickly. However, God gives us the privilege of the unlimited growth of coming to the place where we get to function in the same kind of love that he has. He gives it to us so we can function in it. So that that same life of the Lord Jesus Christ, that same love, that same willingness to go to the cross for every single person. If God so loved us, we ought to also love the brethren in the same way. That's hard for you to do. Well, they didn't treat me right. And I'll just tell you right now, I'm not letting anybody run right after me. You selfish. You selfish. You immature. You're throwing a fit. That's about a four-year-old. Maybe it's three. I tell you right now, nobody's going to treat me like that and get away with it. Why? Why? Can you please explain that to me? Why can't they get away with it? Why not? I think they are going to get away with it. I think what you did was you lost all that you had in getting so upset. And they're still getting away with it. Because what are you going to do? Go kill them? What are you going to do? Go beat them to th thrash them? Are you, are you, hello? Hello? If I had, a, if I had one of those sh shofars, I'd blow it right now. Better yet, a trumpet. Father's calling us to a place that most of us just don't really want to go there. He's calling us to a, the most beautiful, the most wonderful place where peace that passes understanding exists, where love that goes beyond knowledge, goes beyond all experience exists. 
But there are things that we've got, to, we've got to process different. We've got to look at them different. We've got to participate with God in a different way. His word has got to be able to rule our hearts and our minds. Because otherwise, other things are going to get in there and rule them. And we're going to continue to live the way that we've lived because we process things the same way. And we've never let anybody get in any way with anything. And we're always going to be the defender. And we're going to let everybody know how big our muscles are or whatever. I hope I'm breaking this down for you. I'm hoping that I'm bringing you to a place of really despising yourself. In that sense. I told you it's going to be a motivational message here tonight. (laughs) That we were going to truly motivate you. That you come to a place that you hate your life in this world. That you despise yourself in view of the beauty of his glory. The most perfect men that ever lived, when they show the glory, they saw the beauty, they say, I abhor myself. My comeliness was turned into corruption. When when all that I thought was beautiful about me became so ugly. Paul said, I tell you, everything that I've known and everything that I've accomplished and done is like dung. I mean, that's getting nasty compared to the knowledge of Jesus. Come on now. We want you to step up into another realm of maturity, of emotional and psychological maturity, where you just don't fall apart of a slice little thing to happen. Hallelujah. Where you can begin to be kept by the, the power of God, where, where all the accusation, the persecution, all the other stuff that comes at you doesn't even affect you. you got a shield of faith. you got an armament of the Holy Ghost. you got a fire of God and glory of God all around you. you got God keeping you. And you keeping yourself. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it proceeds the issues of life. And a lot of people allowing things into their heart that's not supposed to be there. God cleaned out the heart when he gave you a new heart. But you better be careful because you may be in relationships. You may have had events. Uh, you may have had tragic events, even. Real, true, genuine, tragic events. Like the death of, some, the, a, death of a loved one. Tragic event. Uh, uh, you know, a, a loss of an occupation or a job that was done in a very hateful and demeaning way way that just crushed you, that just snatched the rug of life, as it were, out from underneath you. I mean, those are things that are real. Most of what people are dealing with are not even on that scale. But even in that dimension, there is a place where you can keep your heart with all diligence, where those things cannot rule over you and dominate you, where the healing virtue of heaven will flow through you, wash it away, bring you insight, help you to understand so that it's, it's placed in a position of trusting God and it's not something that just rules your heart and your mind continually. There's people who had, you know, that's had a death of a loved one and it just rules their heart and mind continually. They just live under the spirit of death. They just live under it. There's people who've had tragic events in their life of rejection, divorce, other types of uh, tragic broken relationship, and it just rules them. It's just cancer to the brain. They can't get over it. They can't get past it. Only the healing waters, only the miracle supply in heaven can wash that away, can heal them. And, and, and the beautiful thing of it is, is that miracle is available, and I've watched that miracle work for everyone who's been willing to allow those healing waters to flow. But unfortunately, most of the things that God's people are being held back by are really insignificant things. So it really doesn't matter whether it's significant or insignificant. God's got the same response for us. He wants us to come into a place of loving Him, a relationship. God wants us to get our relationship in order and our priorities in our relationship in order. In so much that our relationship with Him is above all other relationships. Huh? That's the number one relationship. Everything else is subordinate to that. So you can lose everything else. Guess what? You're never going to lose God. You can lose everything else and it's going to be all right because the number one most important relationship, it remains intact. Everything else. This is why I'm helping my wife with this because she's like, you know, honey, you know, you know, I, I, I can't go on another day without you. If you die, I have to die at the same time you die. I said, baby, don't even start thinking that way. Please, you know, don't even set that thing up. Let's get your heart where your number one relationship is. And come on now, because that's only an indication that 
I, I, I'm, I'm blessed, and I know the Lord's blessed, that my wife loves me so much, and then I love her in the same way, and feel the same way, but we have to check that stuff and say, wait a minute, there's a number one priority, we're following Him. We're walking together following Him, He's our number one love relationship. He's the number one priority. Everything else is subordinate to that. So that there can't be these devastations in our life that completely take us out of our interaction with Him. And we've got to have that on every scale of life. I've just swung the pendulum now to the maximum, okay? I've gone from the minimum of dishwashing dishes to the maximum of how our relationship hierarchy works. And people, these things are real. You, listen, you need to take notes on this. This isn't something that you can just casually listen to. These are things that you better put in place. Otherwise, you're going to suffer bad consequences for not doing so. You're never going to mature unless you do it. As long as you allow the selfishness of your own life to ruin your life, it's going to continue on ruining it. And it's not going to ever bless you. That's why the Lord said, you want to be my disciple? Then you're going to do this. You're going to deny yourself on a daily basis. People would rather say, oh, we're going to die. You ain't dying. You denying. Hallelujah. Jesus denied himself. It wasn't about doing his will. It wasn't about pursuing what he, his interest. He did exactly what Father told him. He came here to live at, for one purpose, to go to an appointment that Father had for him at Calvary's cross to pay in full for your sins and my sins because God spared not his own son, spared no expense for you and me so he could get us back. And let me say a little side note here on this. Jesus did not die to save people who weren't, didn't want to be delivered from sin. He did not. Jesus died for people who were desperate about being delivered from sin. You better believe it, because it is the truth. People who just want to say that they know him and continue on in sin, nobody said it better than John. You a liar. That's what he said. That's what John said. He come right out with the big L word. You liar. Yeah. He that says he knows him, loves him, walks in darkness, is a liar and does not the truth. Jesus came as Messiah, which means Savior. As Messiah, which means Deliverer. He was for us just like Abraham was for Lot. You understand? Like Moses was for Israel. I like the description of Abraham for Lot because Lot has been taken by the four kings and held in prison. I'm going to be sold into slavery. He wants to be delivered. He's not all excited about, hey, man, I don't mind being out here being a slave, getting beat up, harassed, tormented, tortured. It's fine with me. You know, he wants to be delivered from it. Abraham comes as a Savior to deliver him. Praise God. Jesus came as a Savior to deliver me. I don't want anything to do with sin. Why? Because I know sin is far more than this concept of missing the mark. That is a gross understatement. That is absolutely not even true. Sin is not missing the mark. It's missing the whole program. It's missing the whole target. It's missing the, it's, it's pointing in the wrong direction. <laughs> Sin is literally obedience to Satan. It is servitude to Satan. It's coming under his dominion. It's an act of treason against God. People need to get that. That is one area where people aren't processing right. They don't think right. Their perception's all messed up. Their perceptions have not been conformed to the word of God. They've not allowed God's perception of sin to become their own perception of sin. How bad is sin? It's so bad that Jesus had to be beaten, busted open with, with whips and rods, crucified at Calvary's cross in a hideous way to bring full ransom for its iniquity. Die and go to hell for three days. And it's worse than that because God said sin's so bad those who continue on in it will burn their smoke. He says like this, the smoke of their torment will rise up before his presence forever. That's wrath. Are you listening to me? And God is intense in his wrath as he is in his, he is intense in his wrath against sin and iniquity and death as he is in his love for life and his love for us. Hallelujah. You better get it right. You better start processing right. You better go ahead and let God change your mind. You better go ahead and let God change the way you think because you're never going to do anything that you need to do or do different things differently until you think differently, until your mind processes differently, 
until you call sin as bad as it is. Listen, people, we need a revival and an awakening to come to the United States of America. However, if you participate with the same ugliness of sin that has made America full of its, in its state that it's in, if you participate with the same iniquity, if you participate with those things that give Satan power and authority over men, then there's no way that you can be a part of a revival or an awakening because you've abdicated your authority and come under the dominion of the power of the satanic realm. And you have no authority. None. And Father has made the church the one that holds back sin. But if we're participating with it, we're not holding nothing back. We're salt that has lost its savor. If your salt has lost its, is no, is, is lost its taste, if the salt is now tasteless, are you going to go get salt to salt your salt? No, because that's what Jesus said. Are you going to get salt to salt your taste for salt? No, you're going to throw it out. What are people going to do? Walk on it. It's going to be trodden under of men, trodden under the food of fit of men. You know what that is? Religion. People are just going to walk all over. It's, going to, it's, not, it's worthless. It's worthless. And he's talking about the bondage to sin and the, uh, and the obedience to sin. We're going to have to step up and begin now to participate with God in such a way that we have authority now to break off the yoke. It's as the psalmist said. He said, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Then I will treat, teach transgressors the right way and sinners will be converted. People want to be able to go ahead and continue on and sin and participate with the powers of darkness and be under subject to the demon spirits and say that they have authority to cast out devils, demon spirits. Well, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. There's two verses of Scripture that I want to, 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 to give to you to try to now bring things together for you a little bit clearer of where ultimately I, I want to take this. And the first one is in Philippians chapter 4, 8. I just want to go and refer to that. And then I want to go to a passage of Scripture in Romans. And I want to bring this thing to a focal point of the most important perception that you and I must have about our life. We must understand the boundaries and the limitations that have been set upon us within the framework of how we're supposed to interact with the world. And the unlimited realm of opportunity that God has given to us to know him and ultimately participate with him to where that we walk in all his authority, all his power, all of his glory, all of his blessings. Everything that I'm going to tell you, everything that we're talking about, no matter whether it's tonight or whatever night, you've got to change the way you think. An event's got to happen. We're going to persuade you with the word of God to change the way you think. I love, like I said, my wife and I challenge each other, I love watching my wife implement things where she says, okay, I may not understand it, but I give myself to thinking this way now. And I accept it fully. And thus accepting this fully, this picture, now I'm going to operate and do the things that I do within the framework of this bigger picture, of this new way of thinking. Now there's a battle. Because you might think, wait a minute. It ain't right. Oh, it is right. It's the word of God. It's right. Just do it that way. And accept it. And what's going to happen is you're going to get very comfortable with results. And you're going to get comfortable with the actions. One of those things, self-defense. God did not make you a lion. You're not a lion. God did not call you the lion of his pasture. And the pride of his hand. And the pride of his hand. No. <coughs> Excuse me. Called you the sheep of his pasture. Amen. His lambs. Defenseless. You open not your mouth. You love. If you're treated wrong, you commit yourself to him who judge righteously. Let him take care of it. 
Huh? When you're cursed, you bless, that you may inherit a blessing. That's called the meek. The meek will inherit the earth. They will. God said so. You're not meek. You want to get into a fight? You got to fight all the time. You're not inheriting nothing. You got to be the defender of your own self. You got to be grabbing everything. You got to champion your own self interest. God, the Holy Ghost, can't protect you that way. He can't keep you because you're unwilling to walk in obedience, which is essential to walking with Him. You're unwilling to walk in the Spirit, to walk in His ways, to simply obey Him. As I said on Sunday night, the way that Abraham successfully passed the test was that he gave himself, consecrated himself to absolutely obeying God's word even though he could not understand it. Take your son and offer him for a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. There's no way Abraham could understand that. There's no way that he could put that into any kind of framework of logic or rational thinking of God. What he had already committed himself to do was to absolutely, unswervingly obey God's word to the, to the detail. Huh? You want to you have the same success? Then you need to do it. You need to do it. You need to take inventory of your life. You need to examine yourself. You need to look at what's going on with respect to how you obey God. Because that's what's going to make you successful. Ultimately, in Him, He is a rewarder. I mean, he, he, he lays out multiple rewards. Rewards without end for those who obey Him, for those who seek Him. He's a blesser. He's blessing. That's why He says, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are they that mourn. Blessed are they. I mean, that hunger and thirst. It's just ble the blessings on you. You want to be blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places? Do what God says to do. He earmarks his children as those who walk in love. And there's hierarchies of that. Number one, it's your love between you and the Father. It's the love between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. The love between you and the Holy Spirit. A living reality of a relationship that becomes something that is real. Not just you know, imaginary. It's real. It's an interaction. Think about it. Next is the love relationship between you and your spouse. You and your parents. The parents and the children. The siblings in the house. Then, it's your relationship to the church. Then, after that, it's the relationship to the world around you. But the real reciprocation of genuine godly love happens in the context of, first and foremost, between us and the Father, family, and the church, the brethren, the household of faith. The Lord earmarks those who walk in love as His children. And everybody else is not His children. And He defines love on the basis of what Jesus did for us, of what He did for us. He spared no expense for our sake. He, he, and, and in that context, He tells us, to esteem everyone better than ourselves. He tells us to submit ourselves one to another. He tells us to walk in love. He tells us, you know, out of, out of, these, out of these various different um, verses of Scripture, all the dimensions of blessings that will come because, uh, to another person because you're walking in the same kind of love that Father has for them. You've got to have a mind change, a perception change to where that becomes important to you. Otherwise, you just come basically, you watch it, look around us. People just cut and run all the time. That is, whatever, you know, small little reasons. People gone down the road. Well, I don't need you. Oh, yeah, you do. You probably can't make heaven without me. In that sense of walking in love, let me tell you something. I've devoted my life to studying the Word. And I, I, I've de I devoted the majority, the vast majority of my life to rigorously studying the Word. I mean, just to, just to boast after this manner, in two years I will have translated the entire Bible with volumes of commentary on each book of the Bible. Now, I've discovered this in the Word. That on that day... 
when we stand before the Lord Jesus, he's going to bring us into account on how well we loved. Believe me. We made it all these things. But I'm telling you right, he's made it, I'm telling you right now, he's made it one thing. How well we loved. You better learn how to love well. And to learn how to love well, you're going to have to mature. You're going to have to mature in the things of the Spirit. Because only in spiritual maturity can this love, this unselfish, gracious, good, unfailing love of God begin to express to you. When you begin to recognize that all mercy flows out of love, but when you've got all love, you've got all mercy. When you begin to recognize that all forgiveness flows out of mercy, then you've got all forgiveness. And you recognize that the Lord said, I'll forgive you as much as you need to be forgiven so long as you forgive. How, listen to this. However, if you do not forgive, I will not forgive you one single time. Understand that. Because that's the way it's set up by the Lord Jesus Christ. I forgive you as many times as you need to be forgiven. But if you don't forgive others from your heart, from your heart, I will not forgive you one single time. You need to hear it. And I, you got to understand, that kind of forgiveness only comes out of that love of God. It's an overflow of love. It's an overflow of his unselfishness. It's an overflow of his willing to spare no expense to gain relationship with us. How can we so easily walk away from relationship with one another? It's just not in God. It's not godly. It's not real when you can do that. People come up with their excuses. Imaginations. People come up with their justifications. That's self-justification or self-righteousness. Because there is absolutely no exclusion clause. Special condition clause. When we define God's love for us, enemies, by wicked works, ungodly, without God, hmm? and the whole list that goes along with it, without strength, he commended his love towards us. He loved us. He initiated it. Then when every act of sin is truly an act of treason. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it's truly an act of treason against him. When every act of sin is truly something that is the worst kind of violation in a relationship that could be imagined. It's the worst kind of violation. You had never, no one ever violate you like that. You must understand this. You never had anyone ever violate you. Like an act of sin violates God. And yet he loves us and forgives us and shows mercy to us. And, and then come at the end of that, we're not willing to do it one for another? He says, no. You got, you, you're, not, you're not moving forward till you're willing. No, you're still living in a realm where self dominates you, your own word dominates you, your own perception dominates you. No, you're not moving forward. You stay right where you are until you learn the first principles of the faith. Father wants our whole outlook on life to be his outlook. And praise God he's given us the Holy Ghost so that we can have his outlook. So we can see things as he sees them. People want discernment? Well, you know, well then start seeing things the way God sees them. Hallelujah. <laughs> start believing things the way God has taught us. Then you're going to get yourself in discernment. The Word gives you discernment. People want the Word of knowledge? Then learn the knowledge of God. Give yourself to learning the Word of God. You give yourself to the knowledge of God and learning the Word of God, I'm going to tell you right now, the gift of the Word of knowledge will function in your life. It's all centered right here in this very practical participation with the Word of God who has made manifest Christ Jesus, the living Word of God, the spoken Word of God that proceeds from His mouth that we have written down in the pages called the Bible. And the wonderful, glorious Holy Spirit that has been given to us, who's both with us and in us. He's with me right now. Do you know that he's with you right now? <laughs> this is what the Lord Jesus said. It's fundamental to salvation. What happens when our perception begins to now, we interact with them like that. We say, Holy Spirit, thank you for being here with me. 
You're not going to take too many days of you saying that, and you're, not, and you're going to ultimately feel that you're going to get a reciprocation from him. I, I have a friend of mine who actually may be watching right now, and a dear friend of mine, and uh, every day he used to just kind of fall down in the dirt as he's an excavator guy, works in the dirt. He's a dirt worker. And um, uh, he just fall down in the dirt at his lunch break and just say, you know, begin to cry out to God and say, Lord, I love you. And every day, Lord, I love you. One day the Lord spoke to him and he heard the Lord say, I love you too. That day miracles begin to happen. It ain't going to take long because it, it changes your perception. God becomes real. Huh? You're going to have to decide whether or not God's real or false. Huh? Whether he's here or absent. It ain't going to take too many days and you're saying, Holy Spirit, I'm so glad that you're here with me. And then in a hard time, in a difficult situation, under pressure, Holy Spirit, I'm so glad you're here with me. And that you're in me so that I know how to speak a right word in this situation that I'm in. I know how to act the right way. Hallelujah. I, I think one of the best pieces of advice a person gave me is never make a decision for 24 hours. And then... Uh, you know, that was, that was as, a, as a young man. But then the Holy Spirit spoke to me, said, never make a decision until you feel the love and the peace and the joy. Hallelujah. That was the best. And then it doesn't matter what's coming at me. I don't make a decision out of some kind of emotion or response of, 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 of insult or anger or fear or worry or concern. Of course, I don't want to have that for more than three minutes anyways. In fact, I don't want to have that for more than 30 seconds. I hope that we can be mature enough not to have it at all. Hallelujah. Maybe it flashes by us like a lightning, strike of lightning a second, and then we just say, out, go, you know, messing with me. But what happens when you don't make decisions at all, unless you're overwhelmed with his love and his joy and his peace? See, you can learn how to just calm down in the Holy Ghost. Did you know that? You can learn how to just calm down. You can learn how to relax your mind. You know when you go to sleep at night, your mind relaxes? Uh-huh. Your mind relaxes and strange things start happening, don't it? You start dreaming. Some weird things start going on in your life. Huh? What happens when you can learn how to shut down, relax your mind, let God take over when you got your eyes open? Hallelujah. God, the Holy Ghost gives us the capacity to be able to do that. Amen. My mind is fully relaxed right now. My mind is not engaged really much at all. It's just the Holy Spirit speaking through me. Hallelujah. By doctrine. Doctrine is not something that we get in the frameworks of how a lot of folks conceptualize doctrine. Doctrine comes from the Holy Spirit, just like prophecy, just like knowledge, just like wisdom. Word of God, this God distills it right out of our spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. By His Word. So let me just read this to you real quickly, or maybe not so quickly. In Philippians chapter 4, finally, brethren, <laughs> here's what, in conclusion, in other words, I've said all this just to tell you this, okay? Are you with me? So we're just going to cut to the chase here. We're going to get to the main point. And Philippians has got a lot of great points. But we're going to get to the main point. He says, whatsoever is true. He says, whatsoever is honest, <clears throat> whatsoever is just, righteous, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is good report. In other words, somebody gives you a bad report, you're not supposed to think on it. You're supposed to rebuke it. You're supposed to say, I, I, you're alien, you, you, you eliminate it, erase it by the power of the Holy Ghost. You don't, you don't receive it. I don't receive it. I'm not going to receive. I'm not going to believe it. I may not say anything to anyone. Of course, if I know them and they're supposed to be a a person of God, I'm going to severely chastise them. That's why most people don't give me bad reports. Because I'm going to say I don't want to hear it. If I if I look at a, if I look at an email or anything and it looks negative to me. I immediately send it where it belongs. Trash. <laughs> I'm not going to read it. If I hear something on the radio 
in it, and it's just, it's not a good report from heaven, it's off. Huh? I, I go listen to RF radio, rural network radio, and hear how the, how the crane prices are doing. <laughs> you know, I'm not listening to it. I'm not going to receive it into myself. It's not honest. What's honest? The Word of God is honest. What's honest? Honest are those things that are verifiable in the mouth of two or three witnesses. It's not, it's not distorted at all. And I'm going to tell you right now, people, I have watched again and again how folks will take something and make it altogether different than what it was. What was said, what was done, they have learned how to be offended. Spirit of offense is one of Satan's primary weapons that he uses against God's people. And folks don't know how to resist it. They're so used to fellowshipping with that demonic realm. The spirit of offense is a demonic realm. It's a demonic oppression. Jesus talks about oppression and possession in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 and 24. He separates out oppression and possession. You don't need to go look at it right now, but you can take a note of it. And if you can't see that, I'll give you, just the, I'll give you a Greek translation so that you can understand. Here's where, it's one of the first places it's associate, dissociated at. I'm telling you, spirit of offense is an oppressive demon spirit that we give right to. By doing, by, by doing, by disobedience, by doing something we know we're supposed to be doing. By not walking in a love that God has commanded us to walk in. But not walking, usually spirit of offense comes because somebody doesn't want to submit. They're under authority and they're told what to do and they don't want to submit. Spirit of offense comes in. And really what happens, spirit of offense enters through the door called pride and arrogance. Self-exaltation. That's what Satan did. And that's how he originally sinned. That's the original sin. And God's purging the universe so that can never happen again. You think he's going to allow it to go on in our lives? And now we're just going to be set up to do what Satan did again? It'd be purged from our lives. That's what the blood of Jesus Christ came to do. That's what the new birth came to do. And walking in obedience is essential. And I'm going to close here just a minute with that verse of Scripture in Romans, 8, Romans 6, 16. Just here in just a minute. But people, these, these, aren't, these aren't just ideas, concepts that will make your life better and it's totally optional. This Word of God comes out of His mouth. This is the only way you're going to live. Until you do it, you're not going to grow because this is the sincere milk of the word that will cause that maturity, that psychological and that emotional maturity. So that your emotions are governed by love, not by fear. So that your mind and your thinking is governed by the word of God, by his love, by his grace, by his goodness, and not by all the cultural mess that you've been integrated into. I hope that makes sense to you. And God give you understanding concerning these things. Listen, if it's negative, if it's bad, if it's got accusation in it, if it's got hurt, ill feeling in it, I'm going to tell you right now, that's evil. That's going to hold you back. That's going to mess you up. It ain't going to mess the other person up. It's going to mess you up. You mess you up. They didn't mess you up. You messed you up by... Not obeying God, taking heed unto His Word, and walking in that which the Holy Ghost supplied. You know what the Holy Ghost is supplying to us? He's poured the love of God into us. He's poured His love into us by the Holy Ghost. What will that result in? All your experiences will be good. <laughs> you say, that, that just doesn't even make sense. That just isn't even real. That's not even on the radar. Give me a break. No, no, no. You could turn every one of these situations around. And in the midst of somebody doing you wrong, you can bless them and love them, heap coals of fire upon them, and bring them to an experience in the knowledge of God. I know that, uh, for example, Summer was telling me that one day, uh, Brittany just came to her and would just, you know, just, just love in on her. And it just touched her so deeply. 
Because Brittany wasn't going to allow, Brittany was the boss in the situation kind of thing. Brittany wasn't going to allow a bad feeling or a little, little, little ruffle thing to happen. Summer didn't know the Lord. Summer just as lost as anybody else is lost. Brittany just shows her the love of Jesus. So I'm just going to walk in love here. Then ultimately brings her to the meeting. She comes, responds to the altar call. But she said that that's not really where the change took place. All of a sudden, all, everybody came up to her and just started loving on her. And she said, it was that, that's where the change took place. Love is a powerful authority of the expression of God the Holy Ghost through our lives that changes the hardest hearts. And what happens is we get so locked into the prison of self-consciousness of all that we believe and all that we think. And it's all a lie. All that you believe and all that you think through a human perception is a lie. It's a distortion. It's a deception wrought by the God of this world. You believe me, there is only one truth. There is only one spirit of truth. There's only one thing that is honest. There's only one thing that is real. And those are the things which God is describing to us and declaring to us in his word. That's real. You want to stay in reality? You want to stay in the truth. There is no truth outside the word of God. There is no truth outside of Jesus. Now, I know people get all excited about their orthodoxy. Oh, yeah, praise God, amen. But Father wants orthopraxy. He's looking for people to do this because it's not real till you do it. So, really, orthodoxy means nothing. And we ought to be getting on to folks and straightening people out about their orthopraxy the way they live it. And when you're not living it, you, you've got false doctrine. I don't care how much you believe or how much you say it correctly. If you're not living it, you're living in false doctrine. You hear me now? Because we made a big deal out of semantics. Huh? We made a big deal out of speeches, fair speeches. And then by that, we have the rule of whether or not it's truth or error. No. God says it's not the hearer, it's the doer that's justified. The real truth or error is by the fruits. I mean, you look at, you look at John the Baptist. Everybody's coming to him. And in the wilderness, Jordan, to be baptized. Pharisees and Sadducees show up. And he said, how did you offspring of snakes and vipers get here? Who warned you? Concerning the wrath of God that's about to be revealed. And then immediately, can you imagine John? And he went saying that smiling. <laughs> oh, how did you? Offspring of snakes and vipers. <laughs> Happen to get here. <laughs> he didn't do it that way. I'm sure of it. It wouldn't have the same impact. God, when God speaks, he thunders. I'm telling you right now. There's a passion. There's a passion there. God's passionate. And immediately said, you bring forth fruits worthy. I try to make that Greek word prove, to, be, to mean prove, because it made more sense to me. Bring forth fruits to prove your true repentance. But it doesn't mean that at all. You cannot, you cannot dislodge it from worthy. You bring forth fruits that are worthy of repentance. It's like a pure sacrifice, something that's worthy to offer to God. Can't get around it. Let's see a worthy sacrifice. Let's see a sacrifice of your heart and of your life surrendered over to God. Not some pious disposition. Come on now, people. It's God... The truth of God's word is manifested in the reality of our life through love. The acts of love. The deeds of love. The disposition of love. That's why Jude said when he brought his whole thing to a conclusion, he's saying, Keep your, so build yourself up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourself in the love of God. Paul says it like this. He said, you can have, the, you can have all faith to move mountains, tongues of men and angels. If you have not love, it profits you nothing. I mean, love 
is the fulfillment of everything that God has purposed. It works no ill against anyone. That's why it fulfills everything that is in the law. It fulfills all God's desire for man. You want to be pleasing unto God? This is where we're supposed to be at. This is what he calls us to come into. It is so much the, the full expression of his glory. When you stand there, all you feel is so accepted, so loved. You fit in. You know those relationships that you have, and you just like you've known of that person forever. You feel so comfortable. It's just right. You know, it's all those different experience, all those different expressions that people say, kinsmen, uh, you know, whatever, kindred spirits, whatever. All these different <laughs> expressions people have. No, 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 it's beyond that when you're standing there in that glory. Can you, can you imagine? Hallelujah. Can you imagine that we may be, this is how we're presented before him with boldness. Huh? To know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. He that dwells in love dwells in God. Herein is our love made perfect that in the day of judgment we may have boldness. Hmm? Because as he is, so are we. He's given us the honor to be one with him. Wow. He's given us the honor of holy union. He's given us the honor not of just friends, one. I'm in you, you're in me. Give us the honor and privilege of continually being filled. Give us the honor the privilege of continually putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't have your life in his life. And what you've got to get a hold of is, is a perception that's hard for people to get. It's hard for people to get. It's another way of thinking. You no longer live. That's a tough one. Go ahead, put that one up top of your list. Say, it's going to be really hard for me to do this one. I'm going to really have to start thinking different to do this one. Because I no longer live. It's Christ who lives. You're going to have to get worthy. You're going to have to get holy. You're going to have to get accepted in the beloved. You're going to have to get filled with the Spirit. You're going to have to get born again to be able to say that. I no longer live. It's Christ who lives. Wow. A gift that is given to us. A free gift. Not, not anything that is earned. You can never earn it. All God's waiting to, you, for, uh, all God is waiting for us to do, all God's waiting on is for us to accept that. That's it. When we accept it, we get to move forward. Until we accept it, we're still just wavering back and forth. We're not moving forward. Huh? We took a little sip of milk, but we spit it out. <laughs> took a little sip of milk, spit it out. Swallow. Take that inside your bosom. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anybody ever fasted for a long time to where you're just so weak? After about 10 hours, I get so weak. <laughs> After three days, I'm like. <laughs> I'm almost catatonic. You just have no energy at all, no life at all, no ability, no strength at all, almost. Huh? And now you're breaking the fast with a little sip of orange juice. And you take that one sip of orange juice, and it's like, you know, it's like Popeye with a spinach. <laughs> you know? All of a sudden, you just come alive. You're just strengthened. You have, you have ability to move and do now. Just one little sip of orange juice. That's the way the Word of God is. That's the way the sincere milk of the Word is. Swallow it. Say it's mine. These things that God has said, I will do. I'm not going to. Thus, I now can begin to bring into captivity every thought. I can now cast down imaginations. And all the high things that are being imposed upon me by the spiritual wickedness in high places that are contrary to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, the knowledge of who he is and what he taught us to be. Say, I'm going to think different. I know it's going to be a battle. Do you know that it's going to be a battle? That's why the Lord said the weapons of your warfare are not carnal, but mighty. I mean, he gave us mighty weapons to do this. In the context. To pull down these strongholds. The strongholds of the mind. There is nothing that is more set against you, you and me, than our imaginations. And it takes spiritual, emotional, and psychological maturity 
to even begin to define that. Because people have so lived by imagination, they basically call imagination a true report and reality and a proper way to think. And until you step over here into this plant place of saying, I'm going to have the mind of Christ, I'm going to walk in the Spirit, I'm going to be governed by the Word, I'm going to walk in love, I'm going to keep myself in this place called peace, I'm going to keep myself in this place called joy, you have no ability to discern the two. No, dis no ability. As soon as you commit to walk in love, keep yourself in joy, all of a sudden you're going to be con begin to confront the stuff that you allow to rule your life. And that's a scary thought. And that's a scary moment. But it's a great moment. It's a great moment of a new beginning. It's a great moment of awareness. It's a great moment of consciousness. It's a waking now out of your sleep to arise unto Christ to now live out this life that God has presented us to have. Ah, oh, don't stick on to me. There ain't nobody depressed in heaven. I'm telling you, there ain't nobody ever learned how to walk in the Holy Ghost that isn't happy and shouting the joy and singing the praises all day long, singing and making melody in their heart. Then nobody been filled with the Spirit that does it any other way. And until you do it, you don't fit in. And so now you need to deal with it. Quit self-justifying. That's self-righteousness. Quit Quit confirming your wrong way of thinking. Hmm? Quit believing that you have to do it this way. Otherwise, it ain't going to be right. Be conformed to the image of the Son. Put on the, the mind of Christ. Let this mind which was in Christ Jesus be also in you. You know what that mind was in Philippians? That was the mind that says, I'm going to be everybody's servant. Try to wear that one day. And if you're willing to do it in such a way, hallelujah, to wear it true from the heart, and you're saying, Holy Spirit, show me how to do this, you're going to discover that you just lived the best day of your entire existence. To let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who emptied himself, hallelujah, kodabaraneah, he la emptied himself. You reckon you need to? He emptied himself. Hallelujah. Har also pobre. And made himself of no reputation. People running around here trying to. It's all about reputation. It's all about. Uh, it's ridiculous. It's another, it's another photo opportunity. It's another brag, bragitis about how big and how wonderful and how mighty. I mean, I mean, you know, Jesus, he's doing miracles. Don't tell anybody. We're doing miracles. Tell everybody. <laughs> Don't tell everybody. You will not believe what just happened. This person had a, had a, had a bad toenail. And now, the Lord's raising the dead. <laughs> Blind eyes, deaf ears. He's saying, tell nobody. We get somebody, filled, get somebody who's got a headache healed. And we're just like, want to put it on a radio and television commercial. Invite the masses to come to be healed too. I'm going to tell you right now, God's miracles will bring growth good enough by all by itself. Don't need, to, don't need any announcements. Hallelujah. Go down. I, just, I want you to start thinking different. We've got to think different. We've got wrong models. See, if we got wrong models and we put them in, 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 in proper places, wrong models in proper places, wrong models in the places of those who we're supposed to follow, we're, our perception, our idea of things, the way we act, the way we behave is going to be all messed up. We got to make sure that every model, everything that we're going to follow, conforms to Jesus Christ, conforms to the Word of God. Paul said, Follow me as I follow Jesus. I want to make sure anybody I follow is following Jesus. Doing it like he did it. Oh, this, I want you to turn Romans 6 16. I got many more things to say concerning this, but I'm going to leave it there. It's enough. Huh? For you start hugging people, I don't want you to hug them. Hallelujah. Have you ever done that? Just bless somebody who's persecuted you. Make them a cake. Do something special for them. Huh? Call the, call the uh, mobile detail service to just deck their car out while they're in the office. And say, by the way, um, don't get alarmed. I, got, I just wanted to bless you. So I called a mobile detail service. They're really good service. And they're out there detailing your car for you. And the person doesn't like you at all. Watch what happens. Watch. Because you can't do the word of God and it not work. 
Huh? You cannot do the word of God and it not produce the fruits that he has proclaimed. Mm -mm -mm. Come on, try it. This is going to be a blessing to you. It's going to be a blessing to you. I mean, you know, you need to be thinking about things like, look, Resurrection Sunday is getting ready to come up. It's a great time to bless kids, poor kids. You need to be thinking about that. Families who don't have much. You know, you know, you start creating an account right now for Christmas next year to find identified people who who don't have much that you can go and bless them. And from the from the inner city to the Indian reservations, various different Native American reservations here in San Diego. There's more in San Diego County than any county in the United States of America, and, and the majority of them are poor. Come on, there's. There's a lot of things you begin to set your heart to do where you can just go bless people. Go love, go practice blessing people. Practice, you want to get, you want to get good? Perfect practice makes perfect. Quit practicing the wrong things. Quit practicing sitting in your living room being upset with life. Bummed out. Feeling like you're not being treated good enough. Amen. Hard to do. Hard to do? Yeah. You know why? You got to deny yourself. Hey, practice makes perfect. It'll get real easy. Denying yourself will become something that you love to do because the overwhelming blessing of his presence and glory of his presence becomes something you can't live without and the self will be so contrasted for you it'll be like somebody stabbing you in the heart. It'd be worse than it'd be worse than any other pain you could possibly feel. It'd be far worse than any indigestion you've ever had. Spiritual indigestion is a wonderful thing. Uh-huh. Because you just had a big dose of self. Huh? Hallelujah. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, listen to me. I know. I'm I'm telling you, I know. I live this. I feel this. I, I experience this. I've given myself over to living the life of Jesus. I've given myself over to being a servant. I've given myself over to laying down my life. Man, I'll tell you right now, if I was living my own life, I wouldn't be here in San Diego. I do not like the city. I, it's spooky to me. People live so close together. I mean, it's just weird to me. I just isn't my way of living. I'm a country boy. I, you know, it's like, it's like the guy, you know, is saying, you know what, I'm, we're really thinking about moving because, you know, the neighbors are getting so close to us now. Um, that we have a gate that's 100 miles down the road. They just built a house. Well, I'm not quite that bad. <laughs> but we just practice this. We, we, I, I'm happy to be here. You know, I was, we we're on the way here, and I just I said, I, I, I said to my wife, I said, I, I, still after all these years, I can't get used to being in the city. I'm still a stranger in the city. And... Um, she said, I feel the same way. She's raising a hoya in the living room. It's like, you talk about transformation. But we're here because this is what the Lord wants us to do. I just whispered to the Lord. I came by this property, whispered to the Lord, said, Lord, if you want me to stay in the city, just give me that property. But I wasn't holding him to it. I whispered, I wasn't holding him to it. Because I, I would have stayed anyway. I'll stay till I'm released. You know why? Because if I go somewhere and I'm not supposed to go there, I just turn into a crybaby. I just walk around. Oh, 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 God. I just walk around crying. Because he, he seized me. And it's wonderful to be seized by God. It's wonderful to get into a place in a relationship with God that you just can't do anything else. He, he has my emotions. He has my passions. They belong to him. And I don't want anything touching my emotions and my passions unless it's Holy, Holy Ghost. And when something else, some other foreign thing tries to touch my emotions and passions, it is weird. It is defined for me as purely demonic. I can feel the demonic. It's purely demonic, and I don't want it. It's wonderful to, to live th that far away from the world. And my concern is that there's a lot of God's people that don't live that far away from the world. It's still too mixed up. It's still too integrated. 
They don't have a contrast. God would teach you how to love righteousness and hate evil. Isn't that good? Did you know that Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered? Did you know that? Isn't that a radical thought? Hebrews chapter 5. Let me read this verse of scripture to you. Which is what I thought I was going to minister solely on tonight. But, you know, we just follow the Holy Spirit. The reality of this verse of scripture is only going to be lived in our life when we think different about things. When the spiritual world becomes real to us. When sin becomes a part of the territory of demon spirits. Huh? When obedience unto righteousness becomes the realm of that, uh, of the heavenly in which we have because we're walking in the Holy Spirit. So we read here in Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. The Lord says this. Don't you understand that to whomever you yield yourselves bond servants, slaves, literally, to obey his servants you are to whom you obey. Whether of sin unto death, and that's how horrifying sin ought to be. Sin ought to be horrifying. It ought to be scary. Like tumbling in a car because you're going 80 miles an hour and it spins out of control and your whole life passes before you. It's horrifying. You're encountering death. It's monstrous. Sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. See that word obedience? Obedience is very important to God. The Lord wants obedience. Obedience is more important to Him than sacrifice. Or all whole burnt offerings, 1 Samuel 15, 22. Obedience is more important to God than any single thing. There is a spirit of disobedience and there is a spirit of obedience. The spirit of disobedience is the God of this world. Ephesians chapter 2, 2 talks about Him. Paul talks about Him in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. We've been delivered from the spirit of disobedience. We've been given the spirit of obedience, the Holy Spirit. The spirit of the Son is on the inside of us saying, Abba, Father. That's the spirit of obedience. Hallelujah. This is a whole other realm of thinking. We've got to get this demarcation in our lives. Then we can begin to cry out in terror for God to come and help us out of our temptation. Cry out in terror when the powers of darkness are trying to, to deceive us, to bring us into some kind of lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, or pride of life. Oh, people, it's a different way of thinking. It's God's way of thinking. I want you to, I want you to look at this one last verse of Scripture here. I just referred to it, so turn to Hebrews chapter 5. Just look at this with me real quickly. In Hebrews chapter 5, in verse 8. Listen, though he were a son... Come on. Yet he learned obedience. Yet he learned obedience. Huh? He learned obedience through the things which he encountered. He suffered. There are many, many, every, Jesus had moment. He was there at the crossroads. He could have chose different things. He could opt it out of the different things that he was having to confront. The persecution, the rejection. The despising, he could have opted out of them. What did he do? Through that event, through those challenges, what he did was he learned absolute obedience to God. He learned just to be obedience. He learned to say, he learned to do this, as it were. I'm not going to think according to my own perception or respond to the situation. I, like Abraham, I'm going to grab a hold of the word of God and I am going to obey the word of God whether I understand it or not. That's learning obedience. Hmm? I'm going to just obey. I'm going to learn the power of obedience just to sell out, to do it God's way, even though everything else is saying I need to do it another way. I'm going to learn how not to have hurt, not to have offense, not to have unforgiveness, not to have self-defense, not to retaliate. Not to, not to have outburst or, 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 or anger or explosive emotions. I'm going to learn how to walk in this beautiful place of temperance. Hallelujah. And temperance, is, temperance isn't being, you know, evenly balanced and steady in your demeanor. Uh -uh. It's being temperance is being given completely over to the rulership of the Holy Ghost at all the time. Amen. And he's ecstatic. He's ecstatic. Hallelujah. 
Harastaya. Now listen, as I'm ministering the word and been preaching the word here, God, he gives to us the empowerment to his word. He sends forth his word and heals us. So if you've had offense in your heart, you've been being ruled by an offense. An offense is a terrible thing. Unforgiveness. You've been being ruled by hurt. You've been being ruled by fear. It's been oppressing you. All those things go away as we're speaking, as we're declaring the word of God. These things have to leave you. They have to depart from you so that you're free now. Now, you can go back and pick it up as soon as you walk outside. it would be waiting for you out there, but it's outside now. Literally, whatever it is, it's outside. It's standing, it could be standing at the door. Huh? You're okay right now. As soon as you walk out of the door, now all of a sudden you're going to be challenged with it. What are you going to do? I would, I'd smash it if I were you. I would, I, would, I would rebuke it. That means to speak strongly and harshly to it. There's one, one person you can speak strong and harsh to. Satan, the devil. Talk to him like a dog. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Tato boku nisigapatahi. The Lord strengthens you to walk in love. As dear children, as beloved children, He strengthens you to walk in love. The Holy Ghost is equipping you to walk in this love. Listen, you got you can't carry stuff. You can't be the one who's going to make it, uh, uh, fix it, huh? You can't be the one who's going to make it happen. You're not the one who who can repair it. You can't sit around and think about all the bad things and all the failures and all the mistakes you made, huh? You got you to just surrender that over to the Lord. You gotta, that's, those are the cares you got to cast upon Him. Because if you continue to think about that, all you're going to do is continue to repeat it. And you're going to continue to just be more of a, the same kind of a problem to yourself and everybody around you. The thing now to do is to recognize what it, what, how terrible it was for you to walk in your own way after your own manner of living. So now that you can just say, I'm not going to do that anymore, Holy Spirit, take full control. Now, I want to understand the principles of it. The principles of it is let this mind, which was in Christ Jesus, be in you, who emptied himself, made himself of no reputation, but humbled himself and became a servant. This is fundamentals to the spiritual laws to this, to walk in meekness and low and spiritual laws, to ultimately how you're going to be able to walk in love, to bless and curse not. This is how you're going to walk in love, to hunger and thirst after righteousness. This is how you're going to walk in love, to build up yourself in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keeping yourself in the love of God. This is how you're going to... Oh, this is how you're going to do these things. To bless. To live it. To bless. To just bless. To do this. To love everybody. To forgive everybody, rather. To bless everybody. To just love everybody. Huh? This is a carefree life. And right now, in the name of Jesus, be empowered to do so. Right now, in the name of Jesus, have a different way of thinking. Quit thinking. Quit justifying that yourself is okay. Doing it your own way is okay. Start now. Understand today. You're going, to, you're going to demand of yourself and recognize that you must live by the Word. You must walk in the Word. You cannot say that you're walking in the Spirit if you're not walking in the Word of God. Because they're, the, they're two. They're, they're the same. They're two in the, <laughs> there's three that bear record in heaven. The Word and the, and the Spirit <laughs> and the Father. There are, three that bear, as there are three that bear record in earth, the water and the Spirit and the blood. These, all, these three agree in, word, in one. You don't have the Holy Ghost without the Word. You don't have a, you don't have father without the word, huh? You're not gonna have you're not gonna have you're not gonna have all the Holy Spirit is gonna be doing is leading us and guiding us in all truth. The truth is His word. The truth is Jesus, His life. Jesus said, "Come follow me." What did Jesus do? What did He do? He made Himself of no reputation. Humbled Himself. He became a servant. How much did He serve us, even unto death, to be our sacrifice, to take our place? Jesus said, Father, you've loved me before the foundation of the world. Now let them come see the glory that I've always had with you. I want them to behold my glory that I've always had with you. Father, we pray, and I, I ask you, Lord Jesus, Ask the Holy Spirit. Cause the people sitting in this church here tonight to begin to have encounters with you where they can see how wonderful it is to walk with you, to be with you, to live with you, to do it your way. Just let them see your beauty. 
Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that the things that have been distracting them, it's been keeping them back from just being with you, spending time in your word, spending time just talking with you and just worshiping you, whatever the things have been that has held them back from just being in you all day long, whether they're at work or play or rest. Father, whatever's been holding them back, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that that thing is broken off of them, that they'll see it. Hallelujah. That they don't become too busy to, to not allow you to be right in the middle. That they recognize that your peace is being right in the middle, middle of you. That being in your love is being right in the big middle of you. That being in your joy is being right in the big middle of you. And when the peace and the joy and the love is waning, they're going off in the wrong direction. Show, Father, I pray in Jesus' name, show every person in here. Lead them, Holy Spirit. Cause them to see and understand how to get right back over in that place of submission to you, of allowing you to live instead of them, allowing your goodness that you brought to us from heaven by the Holy Ghost to dominate their life, to rule their life. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Protaya. See, we've sung the song, There's Room at the Cross for You. Hallelujah. But we haven't sung the song, There's Room at the Right Hand in the Heavenly Realm for You. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then it needs to be there too. Hallelujah. Prosaraneya te. Ha ha ha. Hallelujah. We've been able to think about, we, we died with Christ, but now we need also to think about that we now alive with Him. Hallelujah. Ha ha ha. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let God take your will and merge it with His. Let Him take your life and completely merge it with Him. Isn't that beautiful? For you no longer live. For it's not, it's not your self-interest, which is a distinctive place in which your will now becomes distinctively identified or unique from Father's will. For your whole life just consists and lives and moves and has its being in Him. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody, would you stand with me? Thank you, Lord Jesus. I believe that the Lord has the church at a threshold and a point right now, a place where it's almost like it's almost like an exodus. It's a coming out of things that have been allowed to dominate in the church that are simply other than what God has purposed. Literally, it's bondage and captivity, it's imprisonment. To come out over into a realm of liberation, to live in the inheritance, to live in the good land, to live in the pleasant land. Hallelujah. To live in the holy city. Hallelujah. And I pray that you'll recognize the day and the season in which you find yourself in and you want to be a part of that. You want to be that. You and I are going to have more influence and more impact on an awakening in the United States of America and the world around us, especially the Western world, to see revival come not so much out of what we're able to, how we're able to influence other people around us and how we're able to get other people around us to change. But we're, our real influence is about how we live and the things that we personally choose in our life. The secret realm of our life defined within the context of our relationship with the Lord Jesus. That's where it all begins. That's where greatness begins. That's, that's, the, that's the humility that has to be there before the honor. That's where it all began. Father's looking. Father wants you to just, wants you and me, all of us, He just wants us to step up to a more clearly defined understanding of His will for our lives so that we implement it with extreme aggressiveness. That we implement these things with extreme passion. Hallelujah. I give myself to the Lord. I tell, my, I tell the Lord, I tell Father continually, Lord, I don't want to remain immature. I want to grow up. 
Lord, I don't want to be a baby emotionally and psychologically. Because I understand, I understand emotional and psychological maturity as it is given to us by spiritual maturity. We get to love people. We get to feel good about people no matter how honorary they are. No matter how obstinate they are. No matter how, what it is. It's easy to love the lovely. It's easy to love those who love you. It's easy to love and feel good around those who are always pleasant. It's difficult the other way around. The spiritual maturity allows us to make them more equal. Because we see something different. We don't look on the outward men, but the inward men. We see the need. We see the need. And we have the ability now to supply the change that needs to come. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Play real softly. I will bless the Lord at all times. Play real softly that song. Thank you, Jesus. I speak peace. I speak joy to every person in this place. Let me say this. There, I know that there are a couple of people in here that you have to deal with a harassing, tormenting spirit. That every negative thing that is said or everything that could be taken negatively, you take it negatively. It's like if there's something being identified as wrong, you will think, well, yeah, he's talking about me because I'm wrong. Or you have a situation where you're constantly feeling like people don't like you, people are talking bad about you. That is an oppressive evil spirit. People don't love you, they don't care for you. That is an oppressive evil spirit. It is actually a prison. Listen to me. It's, all, it's actually a prison and can be defined as a lost state. You hear me? Because when you're born again, it's not about how people love you. It's all about how you love everyone else. That's the Spirit of the Son. That's the Holy Ghost. And so we, we don't, we, we, I recognize that people get born again and then come under oppressive evil spirits. Those oppressive evil spirits can come from a different number of different places. Primarily, they come from wrong thinking that ultimately has found its, its place in wrong models. It's found its place in listening to wrong, wrong sermons, wrong ideas. But nonetheless, it opens you up to, to a harassing, tormenting evil spirit. The ministry of Jesus is about healing everybody of their sickness and their diseases and their torments. The Lord did not despise us when we were without strength. He did not despise us when we were ungodly and wicked and, and alienated. He came to heal us, to deliver us. you got to get out of this thing of where you're constantly living shrouded by failure, shrouded by I'm the bad guy. Nobody loves me. No one really cares. And if they did, they would do this and that and the other thing. The list. It's not in the Bible. It's your own list. I know they don't love me because they don't do one, they don't do two, they don't do three, they don't do four, they don't do... It's your list. You're living by your word. You're living by your perception. You're, ru you're ruled by your own ideas. This has got to stop. Because you don't get to go on with God. In fact, it's a backslidden state. You hear me now. It's a backslidden state. And, and, and you, don't, you don't need to walk out of here tonight with that. You just, right there, where you're standing, settle it. It's done. I'm not, living, I'm not living on the oppression of demon spirits. Now, here's the biggest challenge against this. You listen to me. If you've lived too long justifying, self-justifying your state, you have confirmed an existence that is not described in the Bible. That is deception. Listen to me. The Word of God, God the Holy Ghost, God's Word, comes like a hammer to break deception. Comes like a fire to burn up deception. God will not trespass our will. 
What I, what I pray tonight and I've asked God to do, and I'm believing God, this happened in your lives. And, it, and, and I love this church. And to me, this church, and, and, I, and I've got a lot of people stand alongside of me, is one of the best churches in America when it comes to the people who are willing to just get it right and obey God. I mean, it's like the other night when I said, I'm going to pray for the first five people, okay? Look, you, the, the world around you is watching you on web. I'm going to pray for the first five people and just about everybody in the place ran to the front. Come on now. Come on. That's it. You just, you just have that kind of response in every word. Just have that response in everything that the Lord puts his finger on. Go ahead. Cry out to God. Say, Lord, shine the floodlight of heaven upon my soul. Go, go ahead and cry out to God and, and give him permission to correct you and instruct you and lead you in the way of life and know that he's going to answer you and know that he's going to speak just that. I've had many times, I'm not saying this in a self-serving way, I'm just saying this because I wanted you to understand when you ask God, he answers. I've had all through my ministry life, people come and tell me, I just asked, that, I just asked the Lord that question this morning. He's always faithful to answer. I just asked God. I was just talking to God about that. I asked the Lord to say, tell me this today. And, and it came right out. And I, you know, I'm arrested. Whether you realize it or not, Father, when there's a truth in your heart, God's always going to be answering. Sometimes we can't hear. Sometimes we can't hear. Sometimes God gets really rough with us. Did you know that? Hey, you offspring of vipers, who warned you? How did you get here? Who told you about the coming wrath? I mean, that's pretty rough. That's getting rough. He didn't say, get out of here. You leave right now, did he? Isn't that cool? He called them out for who they were. They looked good on the outside. Called them out for who they were and gave them an opportunity. You want to come? You bring fruits worthy of repentance. Ooh, baba. And say not in your heart. We have Abraham unto God. You hear me? You hear what he's saying? You self-justified too long. You've not willing to come under the spotlight of heaven. You've not been willing to examine, be examined by God. You have confirmed your wrong state. Instead of allowing the word of God to measure you. He says, and then listen to what he says. God is able to of these stones raise up children unto himself. That's radical, eh? Eh? You know what he's saying? He's saying, he's saying with the, in the strongest terminology possible, God is going to have what he demands if it's rocks changed into people. Tonight, you and I, we here to give Father what he demands. Willingly, happily, I don't want to be me. I want to be what he wants me to be. I'm not interested in being honest to myself, true to myself. I'm interested in being true to Him. I'm not into this true to myself. I'm in this true to Him. I want my life conformed to His life. I want my life to have the fruits and expression of His Word. That's what we want in this place. That's what the sermons are about. It isn't to make anybody feel bad. It isn't to make anybody feel like that they're lagging behind. It's about getting everybody in line, up front, right in time with what God has purposed to do in our lives. And Father has made it so easy. He's provided the blood to wash away the sin. He's provided the creative work of the Holy Ghost to make a new you and me, a new creation within. Oh, he's provided a love, an unfailing love, a faithfulness, a commitment to us to stand alongside of us, to be our help. To be our strength. There's no way we can fail here. All we got to do is turn away from self and look unto Him and live. If you've been oppressed, if you've come, if you've been bitten by the serpent, if you've been bitten by evil things that torment your mind and you know it's not right, it causes sorrow and sadness, it causes you to wake up every morning on the wrong side of, lo of life or any morning. God said, all you got to do is turn and look and live. Just see my offering. See, Jesus said, even as 
Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. Even so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. So that at any moment, at any time, that we find ourselves overwhelmed and overcome, all we've got to do is turn and look and look and see him lifted up on Calvary's cross to pay the price of our sin and live. And how many times will he do that for us? As many times as we need. So long as we want to get it right. Isn't he amazing? Folk! Oh, Oh, if you can love it. Somebody said, how can you be so merciful? How can you be so loving? Because I've been, I've been, God, I'm the recipient of so much mercy, man. I'm the recipient of so much love. And Bob is so good to me because anytime I start feeling a little bit big in my own thinking, he allows me to see a glimpse of him. And I go all the way back over there to the beginning and say, oh, God. Oh, God. Look at all the mercy that you've shown me. Because when you begin to see his beauty, can I tell you, people, it can feel real undone real quick. You know what? I just, I just, instead of feeling undone, I just feel so much mercy, so much love that I even have a right to be there. How do I even get here? got the privilege of being here in his presence. I just praise the Lord for all the songs and tongues and interpretation of tongues that we just had over the past two services, Sunday morning, Sunday night. Uh, some of those songs, the song Sunday night, that melody was so unique. I just pray, Joshua, if you're listening tonight, please, son, don't let that fall by the wayside. Get that song. It's a Holy Ghost song. Just this song that Ruth Ann Elizabeth began to sing is interpretation of tongues. I mean, cries of the spirits, the cries of the sun. Let's just live there. And we just live to see your face. Let's behold your glory, the glory that has been since the beginning. I'm telling you, very soon, very, very soon. We will stand before the king. Very, very soon we will stand before his majesty. Who will tell you that you're coming? Very, very soon. Nothing's hidden there. See, that's a beautiful thing. It's an amazing thing. When we stand before his presence, nothing's hidden. Everything is revealed. With everything being revealed and everything being open and naked before him with whom we have to do, there's so much love and so much acceptance if our heart's been made right. Tonight, if you have any question about your heart having been made right, let that question be answered. Tonight, if you're uncertain about who you are in him and who he is to you, let that uncertainty be removed from out of your life forever. Tonight, if you question his love for you, if you question your position with him, your disposition with him, your walk with him, let everything be conformed to his will. Let your heart just cry out and say, God, take me and have me fully. I am yours. It's one of the things I love about that song. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Oh, what a life. What a mindset. What a state of thinking. I'm not my own person anymore. I don't even have the rights to choose how I feel about things. I tell myself how I feel based upon what God said. Take my heart. It is thine own. It shall be your royal throne. My, what a state of being. What a life to live. What a glory. Tak, tak, taraneke. Oh, there's, there's the expressions of the Holy Ghost and prophecy. There's the expressions of the Holy Ghost. In interpretation of tongues and tongues, in the expressions of the Holy Ghost and praise, the expression of the Holy Ghost and revel revelation and knowledge and doctrine. He wants to just fill our mouths with all these good things. It's time for us to shut down all the bad things so the good things can come out. You got to understand, you can't draw or get sweet and bitter water out of the same fountain. You got to find a valve and, for the bitter water and shut it off once and for all. And if it springs a leak, go thing and cut, take it out all together. Hallelujah. Don't allow it. Don't allow it. 
you don't have a right. We don't have a right. We're His. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. You want to have a lovely life? You want to wake up every day just so happy, just so blessed? You want to see everything shift right into an agreement with God? Certainly been by Philippians 4.8. Just, you'll move right on into faith. You know, what, you know what my mother taught me how to do as a young, at a young age? My mama taught me how to see things in view of the eternal purposes of God. Don't see it as it is. See it as God's purposed it to be. Radical concept. Don't see it. Don't, don't deal with it as it is. Deal with it as God's purposed it be, to be. Because faith is the hoopastos. It's the place to stand. Or the place... Faith is the substance, it's really the place to stand, the hypostasis, the things you're confident in. Whether you say hope or confident, I believe it's confidence. God gives us confidence. Faith is this place for you to stand, the things that you hope for. It is the evidence. Seeing it as God sees it, seeing it God, as God has purposed it to be, I'll have it no other way. I'll have it as God has purposed it to be, I'll have it no other way. Somebody said, you're not living in reality. You're stepping out of reality. No, I'm not stepping into reality. I'm stepping into reality. See, it's a, different, it's a different way of thinking, you see? I'm stepping into reality. Reality is the way that God said it, the way that God has purposed it, the way that God has meant for it to be. What I'm seeing here, if it's opposite of that or different from that, that's not reality. That's a deception. And I'm speaking to the mountain, and I'm commanded to conform to, words, to the Word of God. I'm commanding it to obey what God has declared and what God has spoken. I'm hooking up with God. I'm hooking up with the unseen realm to declare it that it must exist in that which is vis the visible realm. So you'll, you'll wake up on the right side of life every day. You're going to get happy. Things are going to get good. Hallelujah. Broke on the day, I say. One first I was, I was preaching a message along these lines one day, and a person came to me and said, You don't understand. My mother is actually a manifest demon from hell. And, uh, and her mom had been involved in the mafia. Her husband was one of the premier leaders of the, of the mafia. Um, yeah, she, um, the, 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 what the lady was saying wasn't too far from the truth. I said, well, you listen, what you, what you, here's your problem. Your problem is you're seeing that which Satan has created instead of what God has intended and purpose. Can you believe that your, your mother would be saved and completely delivered? Oh, yes, I can believe that. Well, then see it. Start seeing her. Ooh, start, start, don't just start, don't just pray. Prayer, prayer is the key to heaven, but faith unlocks the door. Go ahead and get in the realms of faith. See it. See it done. Begin to interact with it on that level. Ooh, all the worry, all the problem, all the torment, all the torture, all the harassment, all the unbelief just go, begins to go out the door. You'll grow in this. You'll get good after about 10 years. You don't even have to wait 10 years. You get good in 10, 10 months. You don't have to wait 10 months. You get good in 10 days. It's just how well you yield. And the, the more you yield and the more you learn to yield, huh? the quicker the that work is done. The activity. I'm speaking to you after the Spirit. I'm speaking right into your spiritual being. I'm speaking into your spiritual man. I'm giving you things not to think about. I'm giving you things to do. I'm giving you a new way to live your life, a new way to, 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 to interact with God after a godly sort. Call those things which are not as though they were. Do it like God does it. Hallelujah. 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 Don't no, say, well, I'm calling those things that are not as though they were because you're going to emphasize the not. Okay? <laughs> Just get over and see him into the affair. <laughs> Hallelujah. He turned your purpose into God. So Just raise your hand. The presence of Jesus is here. The power of God is here. I'm telling you, the power of God is here. Faith is here. The working of the Holy Ghost is here. Change is here. The empowerment of change is here. The mind of Christ. The mind of the Spirit. The thinkings of God, they hear. They not aloof from you. They're now here. They're now. They're beside you and in you. Right beside you and in, in you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm telling you right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I see an effectiveness in your life 
happening right now that is going to cause you to become far more fruitful in the things of God. It's going to result in growth in your own life. It's going to result in growth in this church and this ministry. Effectiveness through your life individually and also collectively here in this church. It's happening. There is a dimension of divine breakthrough that is just happening in this church. Period. Hallelujah. Ha <laughs> ha. There is a coming together. There is a connectivity that is happening. There is a yieldedness. There is a submission. There is a hunger. And I'm not calling things that are not as though they were. I'm telling you. I'm, doing, this is, I'm just calling things as they are. Hallelujah. I've been calling things as they are. That, that are not as though they were. Uh, uh, we, we got out of that phase. Praise God. I see the power of God at work to bring forth those in this place that are going to champion an exodus, a moving of God, a moving forward in God, a moving out of those things which have hindered and stopped us, that have been stuffed, that are just un nothing, salt without savor, life underneath a basket. Instead of set light, a light underneath the basket, instead of some light set up on the stand, light lampstand. Hallelujah. You just get up every morning and say, God's got great plans for me. You just get up every morning and walk around saying, I'm just excited to see what God's going to do today. Hallelujah. Sign bold in name day. Hallelujah. I thought I, I thought I needed... I thought I needed so much money last month for next month. And then I discovered I need twice as much as what I thought I needed. So I need twice the miracle that I thought I was going to have. Is it any bigger burden to have twice the miracle as one miracle? You know, you just basically just go ahead. You just get happy about it. Praise God. He goes, oh, no, I need twice the miracle. Now I'm all bummed out. I don't have enough to get twice the miracle. I'm just good for just, just half the miracle. Oh, what? A, it's such... It's a glorious life to live this life of faith. For Christ Jesus is our provider, our protector, and our perfecter. If I see something wrong with me, you know what I do? I run to Jesus. And I say, fix it. Huh? That's what I did when I was a little guy with my dad. If something broke, I just ran to him. Fix it. Huh? If I, if I scrape, scrape my knee or something, I run to mom. Fix it. After I got finished playing, I'm going to fix it until after I'm done. Play is more important than fixing it when you're little. Hi. Just run to Jesus. Fix it. Fix it. Fix it. I'm sitting there. Huh? No, no, no. Run to him. Fix it. Run to him. Say, fix it, Jesus. Fix it. You think he's going, you think, you think he's going to turn you away? You don't think he's going to turn all this attention to you, grab you, pick you up? cuddle you you don't know him. I tell you he is father gonna do it Christ Jesus is gonna do it he loves us so much father spared not father loved us so much he spared no expense Jesus loved so much he was willing to be the offering and Holy Spirit feels exactly the same way both them do and he's not leaving us forever can you get a hold of that? Can you just get that? Can you reach out and grab a hold of that? Can you grab that? Because if you grab that, that's where all faith works. That's where it all works. That's where all the good stuff happens. Huh? That's the freedom. That's the glory. That's the liberty. Just grab it. Just stand here in the presence for just a minute with me. Stand here in the presence. Papa will strengthen you to run in the race. You stand here in this place waiting upon the Lord, listening to His voice. Because oh. they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Talks to the nail. Talks to the faith. Torment of the mind. I break your power. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You foul spirit of condemnation. You lie of accusation. I break your power against the saints of God. I break off your stronghold against the people in this place. I 
Father strengthens every one of you right now and you just receive it. With the ability to stand up against all the wiles of Satan. Holy Ghost is on the inside of you. And he brings the strength of the Lord and the power of his might. Holy Ghost dwells in you. And he's all that you will ever have need of. Now and forever. No matter what you're going through. No matter what challenge you face. God's on your side. He will take your part. And set you in a large, large place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I want you to find a bunch of people around you. Hug them. Tell them that you love them. If there's anyone in here, you need prayer for anything. If there's anybody in this place and you're uncertain about your salvation, you're uncertain about your walk with God, don't leave here uncertain. That is the most terrible, that's the ter most terrible mistake you could make. Don't leave here uncertain. If you're watching on the web, YouTube right now, you're not certain. You don't have to quit watching this program in uncertainty. Right now, you can make a decision. You can call out to God and say, you want to be rescued. You want to be delivered from the state that you're in. And he's the deliverer. He'll come. He'll, he'll answer you. All you have to do is call from your heart. doesn't matter where you're at. doesn't matter what state you find yourself in. He, he will hearken to every voice, every cry, every heart that is sincere towards him. He come to you right now, right where you at. Come to you. If anybody needs prayer for healings, problem in your body, sickness, disease, the Lord, He's the healer. He'll heal you right now. There's not going to be any pneumonia in the place. Hallelujah. There's not going to be any, any affliction and torment in the place. In Jesus' name. God demands that everybody be healed. Everybody be filled. And so we're going to hearken to his demand and, and respond in Jesus' name. So you come worship the Lord with your tithes and with your offerings. Find people around you, hug them, tell them that you love them, bless them in Jesus' name. Once again, if you need prayer for anything, I want you to come because we're going to pray for you. And we know that the Spirit of the Lord will touch you and whatever you have need of, he's going to supply it because he's promised to do so. And he's faithful. Concerning his promises, all of his promises are yes and amen. Hallelujah. None of his promises shall fail. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. What do you need? Okay, lift your hands towards heaven. The Lord's going to touch you right now. In the name of Jesus. Curaba sitia ramosa redi and radani. Prodos renea. Orosa ranea. Is to die. Right now, in Jesus' name, command these headaches to go. In Jesus' name. So fever goes out of your body, sickness departs out of your body. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. What is, this, what is it that you need? In Jesus' name, Father, we thank you for the authority of faith. I thank you, Father God, for the authority of faith. In Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for filling this life with praise and thanksgiving. What is it that you need? Lord Jesus, amen. Thank you for strengthening Veronica. To understand how to simply not live her life, but to live the one that you gave her. Let you live. By the Spirit. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by my Spirit, says the Lord. God strengthens you by His Spirit. Father strengthens you by His Spirit to live this abundant life. Listen, I see the movings of God. I see the movings of God through your life. I see the movings of God in you. It's a simple coming to the simple understanding that this is that which is supplied by the Holy Spirit that's with us and in us. And all we got to do is acknowledge Him, give place to Him, and He takes over. 
It's not by a struggle. It's not by a might. It's not by a power. But it's by a yieldedness to the Lord. Just yielding ourselves to Him. Somebody said, how do you yield yourself? Well, I was going to minister on that a little bit tonight. Obedience. If you obey, the Lord said, you shall eat the good of the land. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Just yieldedness, just the act of obedience is yieldedness. It's not sitting around in a soaking position. So-called obedience. hunger it's thirst like just Lord I want you I want you to rule come rule over me come rule Holy Spirit come rule over me oh what a joyful thought hey don't let it be a sad thought because then that be doubt and unbelief oh come rule over me and it's like oh you need to do it but oh come rule over me let it be a joyful thought because there's faith at work and you know he's going to respond oh rule over me huh. come rule over me yeah, there's a place of brokenness. Understand that there's a place of brokenness because we've not been allowing Him to rule in repentance. But you know, it should shift real quickly into an excitement that these things, He's doing these things for us. What do you want? What do you need? Okay. Okay. Right, just lift your hand. When does it happen? Okay, are you stretching now? Can you stretch out now? Huh? You can't feel it right now. You know why you can't feel it right now? Because an atmosphere of no pain exists right here. And in the name of Jesus, you can walk in this all the rest of your life. It's an atmosphere of the presence of the Lord. reality of it is is the sickness and the disease and all the pain and all that stuff it's gone in his presence it doesn't exist so in the name of Jesus whatever it is whatever the problem is whatever the pain is the source of the pain I command it to leave and not return it has to, it can't return and father I thank you for showing your servant your son how to walk in your miraculous presence his presence being in His presence results in the miracles. Being in His presence results in the signs and the wonders. You know what I'm always amazed at? God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness. I can come to I can come to the meeting so tired, so exhausted, so worn out, and as soon as I walk into the place. A mantle comes upon me to do what he wants me to do, to do what he's called me to do. Isn't that amazing? So you can have the same thing because every one of you, every person in here has different gifts and callings. You don't have to be on the platform to function as a member in the body of Christ. What is it that you want? Father, Father Jason needs a greater understanding of your love for him. We thank you, Father, that you help our frailty of our understanding. You know, one of the places that really begins in our life is when we just speak out his word and we just sit there and we thank him for all that he's said, all that he's done. And just thank him for his love. Just thank him for his love. Hey, how many of you know who supplies faith? Did you, guys, did you guys know that the Holy Ghost actually supplies the faith? It's a fruit of the Spirit. So here the word comes. Faith comes by hearing the word. But you can hear the word and it not profits you. Because it's not mixed with faith. You know that? You understand that? You understand the balance there? What makes a difference? Holy Ghost. 
Holy Spirit, He supplies something to us. So what is it that you want? What is it that you need? Okay. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for all these wonderful expressions. All these wonderful and beautiful dimensions of that which you supply. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for compassion. For brokenness. What is it that you want? What is it that you need? In Jesus' name, have it. Amen. How are you, dear? What is it that you want? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's tough. But the Lord makes a whole new beginning for you. Papa makes a whole new beginning for you. Because he spared no expense to him. And he's an amazing father. You know, that's one of the reasons that I just love to sit and just read the word. You know, there's the studying of the word and then just reading. Going through, just reading. Kind of a regular normal speed. Because I just constantly am discovering all this wonderful dimension of his love and who he is. His good God is. So right now in the name of Jesus. Father said he's given to you spiritual authority, spiritual power. The weapons of your warfare, they're not natural, carnal abilities or weapons. It's power, it's God's power. So you can think different. Father said he made you a new creation. So he says, now think different about yourself. Ephesians 4, 23, 24. He says to us in Romans chapter 12, he says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transfigured by thinking differently about yourself. And then many of the versions said, for example, don't be conformed to this world, and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But just in layman's Greek, it's literally, don't be conformed to this world, be transfigured by thinking differently. So you can start thinking here on that, what Father said. He's going to give you the capacity to love when there's bad stuff, to bless when there's cursing stuff. Just do it His way. Because this is what He wills. And the Holy Spirit has come to supply us with the ability, you with the ability, to do what He's will. What He's will. So, thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, everything about this life becomes yielded to you, Holy Spirit. Everything about this life, from the crown of your daughter's head to the soles of her feet, comes under your divine governance and rule. To live by your word, to live by the Spirit, to be taught of you, Lord God, to desire the sincere milk of the word and to grow in grace like never before, to live out the life of Jesus, whole new life. So just be filled up right now with the Holy Ghost. Just be filled with the Spirit in such a way that the expressions of the Holy Ghost come right up out of your belly. Out of stay Galabatai. Right now, in Jesus' name, be baptized in the Spirit. Baptized in this fire. Baptized in this glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Begins to well up on the inside of you. The man that is to Dorani, the language of heaven to teach you a whole new way of thinking and speaking, begins to flow out of you. Hallelujah. An uh, inexhaustible river of life, an inexhaustible <laughs> expression of God's own love and grace and word, speaking, thinking through you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the name of the Lord. Lift your hand. How are you doing? 
You're doing, you're blessed. Oh, that's good. What do you want? Okay. Go on. In Jesus' name. Go on. How's your spirit? You're strong in the spirit? Do you, do you understand what strength in the spirit means? When you're strong in the things of the spirit, and you're healthy, and your body's healthy, and you're not run down. Any kind of disease or sickness or whatever comes at you, it can't take hold of you. When you're strong and healthy in the spirit, temptation comes your way. And once again, it's like disease and viruses. It's repelled by your body. Be strong. I command you to be strong. Don't keep company with people who don't walk with the Lord. Listen to me. Don't keep company with people who don't walk with the Lord. Do not keep company. You cannot disobey spiritual laws. You listen to me. And end up in a right place. You can't do that which is wrong and end up right. You cannot keep company with those who do not obey the Lord. I don't care who they are. doesn't matter. You don't keep company. It doesn't matter if it's a brother or a sister. You don't keep company with them. The fact of it is, is the Lord even tells us, and defines for us, if one calls himself a brother and they're acting and behaving in certain ways, drunkard, fornicator, etc., keep no company with them. Treat them all together as a, as a person that is lost. Com do not company with them. Listen to me. One day, you become strong enough in the things of the Spirit now where you can go into those realms and you can be the influencer. But that, at that juncture in time, the, deal, the dabbling and diddle-dallying around with sin is a thing of the past. Your strength and ability. Now, you listen to me. This is what the Lord says. Don't disobey God. If you disobey God, you're going to end up in disobedience. Does that make sense? And it's going to be worse than you imagine. So what what is it that you want, Daryl? What is it that you want? Huh? What is it that you need? Okay, Lord Jesus, I pray now by your mighty power, I ask you to strengthen this body. I ask you, Lord, strengthen this body. Be strengthened. 